Turns out that we do not have uh, minutes for tonight, but the first thing we want to do is have a report from the, uh, the CPC and our member, uh, Jason. Thank you. So you're on. Thank you. It's um, a new, new committee that's been formed. So <clears throat> I'll just make this very brief uh, and assume some level of uh, knowledge on the part of people, but you're always free to look it up on the website. On the, um, <clears throat> the town website, there's a section on the Community Preservation Committee. Um, of which I am the representative of the planning board. <clears throat> There's, it's a nine-member board. There's four members chosen by the town manager and then four representatives from other uh, commissions and groups in the town. So uh, just to give you all an update, um, <clears throat> we had our first meeting in February. Um, we, uh, just a little bit of background, we administer the CPA, the Community Preservation Act uh, for Watertown, which was adopted in 2016. The ordinance establishing the, the committee in Watertown was passed in June of 2018. Can everyone hear me okay? Well, yeah, but you're not using the microphone. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, Can people hear him at all? Yep. Are okay. you listening is a real question. <laughs> Never mind. I'll be brief. <laughs> uh, so just to, to tell you what's going on now, we've had a couple meetings. We had our first one in February. We're in the process of um, hiring a consultant. Uh, who will prepare the community preservation plan with us through a public consultation and a whole long process? Um, <clears throat> through and that's we're doing that through the uh, through an RFQ process. We're interviewing a couple candidates um, in September. Hope to have that plan complete by March or April, at which time we'll start hopefully hearing uh, applications for funding. Um, and the the monies can be used uh, for. Um, Recreation and open space, historic preservation, and affordable housing. Um, <clears throat> and uh, again, if you, I'm not going to go into all the details, but all the information is on the website as to how the money is raised, how it can be spent, and uh, what the process is. So that's pretty much it. I will uh, update you as the process moves forward. So just one question. Uh, yep. what, what is the nature of the request? I mean, how would, would they be done by individuals or groups or, I mean? Yep. Yeah, there will be a process by which we'll solicit applications, yeah, and there will be guidelines as to how to put the applications together for to maximize one's chance of um, successful funding, which would be a vote by the, co the committee. And Gideon, uh, jump in and correct me if I'm misstating anything, but we would make recommendations to the town council to um, approve these petitions. Um, again, funded by the, the fund that we have in Watertown, which is co uh, collected from property tax bills and supplemented by the state trust fund, which comes from fees collected at the Registry of Deeds, yeah. or something to that effect. And the property tax was an, an additional 2%, was it not? Uh, is it 2%, Gideon? 1.5? Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have my notes. I, it's... It's 1.5 or 2 percent. It's that, not the max. That is on everybody's property tax bill and goes into the fund. Well, the board is delighted you're representing us. Thank you, sir. Thank you for electing me. So why don't we take our first case? We kind of adjusted the order. I don't, maybe you haven't seen this uh, list, but I have. So uh, 6 Hovey Street comes first. Would you get up and tell us what you want to tell us? What you, surely you've worked this out ahead of time. Uh, maybe not. So I'm Ron Gilboa, and this is Sharon Seltzer, and we're moving in together. Okay. Congratulations. <laughs> but that's not why you're here. I yeah. Think. And part of, or part of the process of uh, moving in together is the need to uh, increase a little bit the space of our dwelling to make sure we have an adequate space for us, the kids, and whatever else we're putting together. And we bought together a, per, a property on 6 Hovey Street, uh, which has one floor that's finished and an attic that is unfinished. And we have put a request uh, to increase our dwelling space by putting a uh, shed dormer on the attic space. Yeah, we're saying that. Like on the back. Yeah, you can see right there. So there's a little bit of uh, accommodation in the front in order to allow for stairs to go up to the uh, attic. So this is the front of the house. There's going to be a small change there to accommodate uh, the space that we're looking for. On the right-hand side, you see the space reserved for washing, drying, and a small office. The majority of the change is going to happen on the 
back of the house. Uh, you can see here, this is the before and after of the side on orchard screen. So this, okay. is the, this is the back. Yep. Okay. Current condition. And uh, and this is the back future condition. So you can see here the shed dormer on the back of, this, of the house, which will house the master bedroom, uh, closets, and a uh, shower. Uh, on the, this is the area where we're abutting our neighbors. So there's only a driveway between the two of us. And this is why we came in front of the board to get the permission to be able to uh, uh, build that because there's not enough setback on this side of the house. Uh, if we go to the next page, uh, why don't we go back to a couple before we go into this area. One more. One more. Existing rear. Okay, one more. One more back. One more, yeah. So go. this is the view of the house today on Orchard Street. The house is a corner lot between Hobby and Orchard. Uh, this is what it looks currently, the current condition. If we go to the next page, uh, our architect uh, managed to put in a small uh, deck on the front there with a door. Uh, and the side of the dormer that you see in front of you is nested back in order to allow for the visuals of the old gable uh, to show correctly. Okay. Uh, yeah. Good. Uh, what view would you like me no, to I put up? Good. Can you hear me? No, just it? what view would you like me to leave well, why, don't we, why don't we keep on going forward? Okay. Uh, so the next page, uh, we see this is the shed dormer that we're proposing to build. Keep on going. Uh, there's nothing much here, we can skip it just by fixing the stairs. This is the second floor living, we're just rearranging a few of the walls uh, to get a little more uh, space. The two bedrooms, we have a little more open space. Two bedrooms remain as they were. Uh, if we go to the next one, this is the proposed area for the attic. So there's a master bedroom on the left hand side, walk-in closet, bathrooms, and a small area for utilities for HVAC. Uh, in a small office area for uh, uh, work and washer and dryer. The total space here is, in conform is confirming, conforming to the regulations with regards to space and height uh, allocated for this area of about 50% below the total square footprint of the, uh, of the third level surface. Uh, I think from here on, basically we just have electrical occurring, uh, this is the uh, roof layout, and if we go a couple more, we'll see the, uh, the uh, area of the zoning. There's going to be a little bit of elevation on the gable, about two or three inches compared to what it is today, in order to allow for the 312 slope to be maintained appropriately. And if we go to the next one, this is just reshoring the joists on the attic floor today, because it's not adequate today. We we'll keep on going from there, one more. One last one. This is yeah. This is the this is the calculation of the area of the new uh, uh, section. So if you can see on the previous in the previous page, we can see the yeah. FAR. There yeah. We can see the FAR uh, percent of the lot uh, beforehand. So you can see that the first, second floors, uh, and the attic area before was 3,844 which is about 70% uh, of this is the existing one. We're not really not fundamentally changing. changing that. So that remains the same. Uh, and this is the area in the dashed lines or the diagonal lines is the area where we propose the new addition. And that adds up based on the rule of not to exceed, uh, you know, just about 50%. Uh, we are below that at 46% of the total space in the, uh, in the data gallery. So that's, in short, what we're doing. Yeah. So maybe we have a staff report. Um, yeah, sure. Um, I think uh, the petitioner has gone over the project in detail. Uh, I, one thing to note with the additional height of the roof, they're able to make the, uh, the house more energy efficient as well. And that would be a, an allowed, you know, they're the sistering and in, in adding a little bit of height to the roof. So that would be, that's a positive, positive change. The, the changes to the front of the house are all within the zoning envelope, so those are allowed as would be allowed as a building permit. Um, we did look at the whole uh, third floor addition as a whole. They initially came in and had a slightly different addition that had lost the, the um, gable end, and so we made some suggestions and they uh, created an 18-inch setback, which we felt was uh, less impactful and 
allowed the, uh, and they also extended the, 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 the main roof along the dormer's bottom, and so that allows the dormer to tuck in and look more like a dormer rather than a third floor from that side within that setback. Um, from a context perspective, this is a corner lot, and this is an unusual two-family in that the, the front door is actually on the side of the house, um, the side. It's the front of the house, um, but the front of the house is the long side, which is uh, actually a really unusual um, in the, in the two families. And so th this house could have easily have had the doors facing Orchard Street on the long end like every other house, and then it would be a slightly undersized side yard instead of a substantially undersized rear yard. And so that's just a zoning anomaly. Uh, I just wanted to note that. And so um, with the changes that they made, staff finds that this uh, requested addition within the side yard setback is, um, oh, they also, sorry, they also made the deck substantially smaller um, so that it was tucked into the gable ends rather than um, encompassing the entire roof of the existing sunroom. And so with those changes and in the context of the neighborhood staff suggests that this is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing condition and recommends uh, conditional approval. And that ends my report. Thank you. So do we have any board member questions or um, comments? Do you want to start? Um, I don't have any questions. I did something very similar to my house at one point, so I get it. Um, and I think it's very responsive to the staff comments in the neighborhood, so I'm, I'm fine with that. So I just have one question. How high, you've got a dimension here for at the perimeter of the house with the new area, the, the ceiling is five foot six in the section, in the section drawing, but how high is it at the ridge? Oh, it's the, the, total, the total space to the ridge? Yeah. Uh, I, the, we should be, I think we have dimensions. Uh, it's not on here. Right? In that section. 30.2. 30.2, the total height of the house. No, no, I'm saying how high is inside space? Inside. Oh, the inside space? Uh, no, it's about... How high is that ridge above yeah, the... Yeah, I want to say it's about 8 feet, you know, a little over 8 feet, uh, yeah. right. because the 7 foot is about, you know, yeah, all right. you know a couple of inches down below. Yeah, it should, uh, should be noted on here. Yeah, so. okay, sure. So it w I would only suggest when you go to the zoning board that you do that. We'll edit it. Yeah. So, sure. Okay. So, uh, actually, I just do have a, a question. Yes. <clears throat> um, in the, <clears throat> the the plan that uh, calculates the half story uh, area towards the uh, towards the end of it, I, I was under the impression that it's above five feet that you count towards FAR. Is it is it four feet? No. no I, I, he showed you that he submitted and showed you that homework, but um, th that's a that's a worksheet that Mike Mena reviews for zoning compliance. There's there's two separate calculations. There's the FAR calculation and there's the half story calculation. The half story calculation, anything above four feet for zoning, that is new construction, is counted, and anything above seven feet that is existing construction is counted. So anywhere where you put a dormer in, that's considered four feet. Mm -hmm. um, if you have existing stairs and you're adding a dormer above that, that is not counted. Mm -hmm. But if you're putting in new stairs, it is counted. Yeah, okay. and so we have a worksheet for that, and he, that's, that's what he was showing. And, and I know for <laughs> building code, it is five feet, but for, for our zo zoning, it is the four-foot line of the roof. All right. Good to know. Thank you. So hearing no further comments, uh, do we have a motion? <clears throat> Sure. Um, I move that the Planning Board recommend to the Zoning Board of Appeals the approval of the special permit finding for uh, the addition in the setbacks under Section 4.06 as it meets the criteria set by the Zoning Ordinance. Is there a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. So, thank you. Yeah. So our second case is 22 Priest Road. Here we are. Yeah. What would you like up, if anything? Well, I got my boards. So okay. Like cyclone? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Sorry. Yeah, please just tell us what you have in mind. on the screen? I think we all have them, but nobody else does, so. So, uh, the existing footprint, uh, that they is the view on this side, you can go through the order. You can just do a brief presentation. Don't worry about what's on the screen. Okay, okay, fine. So, um, what um, would so, you like? Um, I'm going to just work within the existing footprint. Okay. It's here. Uh, so, for the, uh, for the basement level, there's the canopy space that exists today, Actually, a living space on that basement yeah. level. We're going to continue to have them moving in location slightly and in its bedroom. On the first level, we're working within pretty much all the spaces that are there. The kitchen is just getting expanded to bathrooms and being finished. But you're op opening up. <coughs> <coughs> you're opening up the front part a little bit, aren't you? We're opening yeah. up the room yeah. space, right. Just taking out some of those interior walls. I mean, you're ignoring time and what folks are looking for. This is the basement. On the second floor, uh, again, the same right. space, but working within that same envelope. The, the, the one change that we do have here that's probably the more significant is we're going to raise our roof, the new roof on. As your point of mention, we'll be able to also make them more energy efficient as well. Uh, that space is located within small section of the half pulling back on our roof area there will be an open roof deck uh, on that and there's a new stairway so we have to create a dorm to show that that's happening somewhere. Uh, 
this one, that same illustration you just talked about, that last petition, uh, where we're showing that space to stay below the 50 percent, that's how this is the roof. Uh, this is that section where that lawn will come up over the existing stairway. Well, well, it's easy to understand. It's well documented. So, thank you. So, can we get a little staff report? Sure. For the record, Andrea Adams, senior planner. Uh, Mr. Bemis did a pretty good job explaining what's going on with this particular project, and I just direct you to his colored site plan to see a lot of the changes that are going on on the site to make it more consistent with zoning. Um, it is, as he said, asking for an increase in FAR. Um, so we've got two things going on. The lots um, just over 5,000 square feet. It's non-conforming for front, rear yard, and westerly side yard. Um, it was built somewhere in the 20s, um, and it has a few feet of grade change from the front to the rear. It's in the two family, and it's adjacent to a mix of larger ones. Again, the, it's a special permit to increase the FAR up to 0.625 um, to replace an existing low-pitched roof in the second story with a steeper one to allow some living space. They also have dormers above the stairs, which, as was noted in Hovey, don't count. Um, so essentially, we've got a special permit finding. So we've got two things going on. Is it or isn't it um, more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing condition? Um, in terms of looking at the project overall, we believe that the new roof has a similar pitch to many of the houses in the neighborhood and the surrounding homes of a mix of different and similar configurations. So from a design perspective, the new roof and dormer is in keeping with the surrounding homes in the neighborhood. The dormer is in the front gable end, which is not preferred, but that's where the stairs are, so the overall impact is minimal, and the rear deck and stairs are designed to be further away from the adjacent property. Now, again, that's the special permit finding part. The special permit part is to increase the floor area ratio from what they have, which is just under 0 0.5, um, to 6.20, where the maximum is 6.25. And we double-checked the calculations a couple of times, and he, in fact, Mr. Bemis and Mr. Dardone, um, worked on making sure that they were underneath the actual maximum because in some of the original configurations, the, um, the calculation showed they were right at or possibly even over 0.625. So we're very confident that uh, even with the massing that they're adding, that they're not going to exceed that special permit maximum. So the special permit has four specific requirements that have to be met. Is the site appropriate for such a use or condition? And the project all when you look at it in total, requests approximately 519 square feet for the third floor living space. It's less than the maximum FAR, and the location and design is in keeping with the structure in the neighborhood. They're also going to do some site work, um, which will have some benefit to the site, including reduced driveway widths and the four conforming parking spaces, and some landscaping adjacent to the neighbors. 
So the second criteria is a lot similar to the special permit finding one, which is does the use is developed, will it not adversely affect a neighborhood? And again, because it's a bunch of housing styles, many of which are older and larger, the new massing is in keeping with that. Finally, there's, a, or there's two more. One is nuisance or serious hazard to vehicles and pedestrians. We feel with the new configuration, particularly the driveway and the conforming parking spaces, that it's a benefit. And appropriate facilities, meaning utilities, and obviously that's still going to be the case, and they're adding a new dumpster enclosure, which is a good thing because it's screened, and they're adding the uh, planting bed on the eastern border. So all told, we believe that the project meets both the tests of the special permit finding and the special permit to allow uh, those two uh, changes to occur. Thank you. <coughs> do we have board member questions? Mm -hmm. Come um, on. Yeah, yes, yes we do have apparently. Yep. Clarification. Sure. Um, I had directed this to the staff yesterday and I think I understand the answer, but I wanted to clarify. On the um, application form, the height of the building is given as existing 27.7, proposed 32.6. Um, but on the drawings, it shows um, 40 and 42. So I think I'm guessing yeah. that <laughs> you, one is measured from the basement and one is measured from the grid. Right. going into, into the earth. <laughs> right. So I, I think we're going to correct that one. Right. Yeah. It, it, we'll make the adjustment. Okay. Um, and then, th not that this has anything to do with the issues, but is the building occupied at this time? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I wondered that too. Yeah. Because we yeah. saw the posted keep out, and you know, it didn't you know, didn't look real. I think it was just, no, as soon as we get this done, it's taking a little bit longer than we had Sure. Both. Sure. And I know the line was the kept up, which brought to my attention. And I told this to everyone when we get there. I was taking care of this. Yeah. So I'm sorry yeah. for that. Sorry. Okay. 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 Well, other than that, I have no questions or objections. Do you? I do. Yep. A couple quick things. We had um, a comment letter that we received on the 12th, and one of the statements in there is, "I'd like to protect the setback from any structures, porches, stairs, or roofs." I just want to confirm that my understanding is there's no changes to the structure that are going to affect any of the setbacks. I just want to make sure that I had that correct. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. And the other question thing I said, I went out there yesterday and looked at the looking at the site plan. I see what you're trying to do with moving the the walkway so that it's more centered between the, the two cars. Um, and then you've got the trash enclosure. As I was looking at where that trash enclosure is versus the there's that spec it is a truly a specimen evergreen tree there um, on the corner. And uh, the other corner where the trash enclosure is going to go, that one, exactly. When I looked at where the wall lined up on your plan versus where the drip line was and ostensibly where the root line would be, I looked at it and said, I don't think this tree is going to make it. And it's a shame because it really does provide a nice screening. And when you look at the whole context of the neighborhood, if that trash enclosure could be moved over and or maybe even flopped with the, uh, the, um, the stairs and have the stairs in the original location, Maybe that would be a better solution that could protect that tree as well. So. Yeah. 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 Exactly. It just looks like. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. Okay. Okay. Jason. Thanks. Um, I, I just. Uh, I, I'm. I, I read the the letter that that we received here from what appears to be your abutter or the uh, petitioner's abutter behind on Irving Street. Was an email that was forwarded to yeah, I, is, is that gentleman in attendance tonight? And if so, are we going to hear from them? I just, I, I don't fully understand what's being said here and I'd kind of like to get a better I sense of... But I, I can go through the points. Okay. Because it's implied that we were somehow not showing that concrete pad. Porch, uh, that's there today, uh, we're maintaining it, just 
just a just a clarification. Maybe um, uh, initially, when you first came into the office, he was originally going to move the second floor deck over a little. Right, we were. And sorry. and so I wonder if those plans had been they, they may have been available at the beginning. Yeah, so the and architect would that. So, so the original the original plan had the deck moving closer to the side yard property line, mm -hmm. which we we felt was more impactful. And they were once they. Had a clarification with the stairs. They they changed the plan. So 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 it could be reference to that. I don't I don't know. I, I can't interpret mm -hmm. comments. But okay. I mean, you know, I just want to. I, I would want to give some credence to these or opportunity for you know somebody to explain it in more detail. But if that person's not here and you think it's all the points have been addressed or not accurate, then then. Yeah. Um, okay, in, in that case, that's all I have. Thanks. So, hearing no other comments, uh, anybody in the uh, audience have any comments, questions here? Good. So, okay. hearing none, we uh, entertain a motion. Okay, um, I move that um, we recommend conditional approval of the special permit under sections 5.04 for FAR of 6.2 and a special permit finding under section 4.06 for work in the non-conforming side and rear setbacks as the project meets the criteria set forth in the <coughs> Watertown Zoning Ordinance it's consistent with the general purpose of the ordinance. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. So two, two weeks to the plan, uh, zoning board, right? So our next case is uh, 72 Townley Road. So again, if you just briefly say what you're up to, obviously we've read it, but nobody else here has. So. Sure. Um, my name is Jason Sinclair. Uh, this is the architect that worked on our plans, uh, Matt O'Connor. And um, um, my wife and I uh, have lived in Watertown now for in this house at 70 Town the Road for nine, ten years. My wife has actually lived on the same street her whole life. So, well, we have a growing family, and we want to take our single uh, floor house and make it a two floor house. Uh, we don't want to change the footprint, uh, but in terms of the boundaries, uh, we need a special permit to take that house. We're, we're getting it oriented here. It was upside down a moment Sorry. ago. That's yeah, all right. <coughs> you can keep talking. Keep going. Don't worry. Yeah. <coughs> this proposal, the existing lot is undersized for the zoning district. Can you please speak into the microphone? It's hard to hear. your name? I'm Matthew O'Connell. I'm the architect for the building. Um, and the existing uh, lot is undersized for the district by a few um, feet. The front uh, uh, frontage is undersized for the zoning district. Um, but in other, and so the, in the side yard uh, existing structure, and I believe the building predates the zoning in question, uh, is uh, within the, the uh, restraint setback on the right side in particular as we're looking at it by a few feet. And that's all noted in the dimensional application. So we're proposing to not increase any of the nonconformance um, and to go straight up. And in order to do that, uh, what we're proposing, um, if you get to the section which you've seen, um, is to clear span the entire first floor and, and buildings of this age, the interior structure is not capable of holding up a second floor. Um, so that um, requires us to put about a 16, 18 inch um, eye joist all the way across to be able to support the second floor. Um, and then on the uh, roof uh, in question and what would be the attic storage, which is only designated for storage, we're using prefabricated trusses for the same reason because the pick points have to be on the outside walls. We can't support anything on the interior walls. So there's no habitable space in the attic. Um, the proposal is to create a new stairway using one of the small rooms, which is uh, more historically a nursery on the first floor, uh, which uh, is now coming up on the plan. So the stair replaces one of the rooms downstairs. Um, the wall in black is the only intervention on the first floor. And then the second floor is a straight footprint um, comprising uh, a number of bedrooms and two bathrooms. Um, 
that's about it. We had some exchanges with Gideon in the town offices to um, discuss the height and style and so forth, and what you're seeing before you is the current proposal. I will note that the site plan, the surveyed site plan, um, our surveyor coordinated with um, the zoning enforcement officer to calibrate where and how the building height was measured. Um, however, the site plan precedes the reduction in roof heights that you're looking at today, and I can let staff speak to that. Would you like me to show Doesn't matter, it's fine. So, someone has a staff report. Yep, sure. Um, so we, we discussed the project with the applicant. They initially came in with a, a roof. Uh, I think the, the second floor was gonna be at nine feet in height, and the attic was, um, tall enough to be actually used even though it was only gonna have a hatch. And so we, we discussed a few different roof options that could make it be more in keeping with some of the neighborhood. Some of the neighborhood has transitioned to more of this style of colonial. Um, and so there's capes and there's also the, uh, the, the, classic, the ranches that this house is currently. Um, so th they looked at some different scenarios and felt that they um, continuing to keep that, th this style which has the tallest roof but um, drop the second floor to be uh, eight feet and then also drop the attic down so it really is just a storage space. Um, it substantially shortened the house. Uh, I think it was about six, six feet that it shortened it in the redesign, five to six feet. Um, and so, so staff felt that this change substantially reduced the mass um, while still providing the exact same amount of space on the second floor for living space. Uh, and with that, with that change, uh, staff recommended that the design is in keeping with the neighborhood and is not substantially more detrimental um, as the existing condition. Um, one item to note, after the staff report was created, it was identified that there was, I, 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 we missed that there was uh, more than four bedrooms. And so one of the bedrooms will have to either be uh, modified to be not a bedroom or they would have to add an additional parking space. I do not believe that there's a space for a third parking space on the site. So we suggest that um, oftentimes there's an office or a den or some other type of studio space that it, it's probably marked as a bedroom but it really isn't gonna be a bedroom anyways. So we suggest that prior to the zoning board that that get rectified so that it actually complies with zoning. Um, and I apologize that we didn't catch that during the, the staff review initially. So th that's my staff presentation. Thank you. So any questions from board members? Any comments? I do. Thank you. Um, can, can you just, uh, I'm trying to understand from the elevations, what is existing material to remain as far as cladding and what's new? Like is the front, the front is brick and that remains brick. The, there's, a, there's a front uh, clad of brick on the main elevation not the facing gable over the garage. Mm -hmm. The rest of the building is vinyl siding. My expectation is that all the vinyl siding will be replaced okay. and the brick will remain. Okay, uh, that's kind of what I was getting at. I think sometimes trying to piece together siding just doesn't work. And, and also kind of a similar question about the fireplace. I mean, the chimney uh, is the intent to extend it upward? That's correct. It has to be two feet above the nearest 10 and mm -hmm. we've worked with a number of masons over the years to do that. Okay, with brick that will hopefully match. Uh, that's, uh, that's it. Thank you. All set. Anybody okay. in the uh, audience have questions here? Going, going, going. Okay. So okay. we have a. Uh, so if you notice all of our cases tonight, all of them are, have to go to the zoning board. Uh, so this is another one of those. Okay. Um, I move that the Planning Board recommend to the Zoning Board of Appeals the approval of this request for special permit finding under Section 4.06A for the additions and the nonconforming setbacks as it meets the criteria set forth in the zoning ordinance. Is there a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries. So, two weeks you go to the Zoning Board. Okay. Thank you. So our next case is uh, 101, 103 Moore Street. Surely there's someone here to present it. Here he is, there he is.
Yes, Harvey. switch it over. So, since I've been on the board, I've seen this project times. four times at least. I mean, it, I, it's, a me very, think it's, it's a very, very difficult. I mean, it's just way too much building on the site somehow. Yeah. I've okay. transitioned into your HDMI. Scala, and I represent uh, La Court Affordable Trust LLC, which proposes the adaptive reuse of the commercial building at 101 to 103 Moore Street into the Dalby Mill residences. After its namesake, the Dalby Knitting Mill, which was built in 1871 and can be seen in this 1879 map, a Bailey map. Uh, it is the only existing building that I was able to identify in the map, and if you haven't been able to figure out where it is yet, I'm going to blow this up, and this is it right here. Yeah. Uh, this is the 1871 part of the building. The building actually was built in nine different pieces. This is 1871. What's noteworthy, which I will be getting, uh, bringing to the surface momentarily, is that there's also a pond here. Uh, and here, and there's a waterway, and there's a bridge here. Uh, the instant application is for a special permit finding to allow a change of use pursuant, pursuant to section 4.06 of the Watertown Zoning Ordinance and is subject to section 5.07, the affordable housing requirements. As you know, the standard for a special permit finding for this change of use is that the board must simply find the change is not substantially more detrimental than the existing non-conforming use. I intend to clearly show you that the proposed change of use is significantly less detrimental according to every applicable zoning metric in the Watertown Zoning Ordinance, and it is for this very reason that the planning staff report recommends conditional approval of this proposal. There is simply no objective metric that disagrees with the planning staff report. Additionally, the proposal is consistent with Watertown's 2015 comprehensive plan will help to push Watertown closer to the 10% affordable housing requirement that subjects properties like this to 40B applications at the state level. Watertown is currently only at 6.9%. And will dust off and showcase a gem property that has been part of Watertown's historic fabric for 150 years, but has sat unrecognized for many de decades. I believe you will find this application to be generous, thoughtful, and contributing to the values our society holds dear to. Namely, historic education, historic preservation, increased housing, increased affordable housing, efficiency, and beautification. To give you some background on my company, the court presently has a portfolio of over 100 buildings in the Boston area and has extensive experience in adaptive reuse projects. We have immaculately restored historic buildings as old as 1898 to original form and achieved silver lead certifications in the process. This panel showcases some of LaCourt's dedication in, their, in these various endeavors. Uh, what you can see on the, in, the, in the top of the panel is basically our, our standard kitchen setup. This happens to be a strip kitchen, but you can see the materials are going to be the same as we always do in all of our properties, which are cherry cabinets, stainless uh, appliances, hardwood floors, where we can in our adaptive reuse projects, we try to leave brick exposed, we try to restore it if it needs to be restored, or we try to leave it alone to, to capture some of the age of the property. Uh, in the top left, uh, actually in the <coughs> middle left, is your typical hallway when you've got one of these adaptive reuse projects. And those hallways can be very stark. This happens to be a school building hallway, and you can see that the paint stops at about eight feet tall, and that's where the lockers stop. And those hallways could be just simply refinished with basic surfaces, but we don't like to do that. What we're looking to do in our work is impeccable work. And so in the top left corner, uh, you can see what we typically do with our hallways. We will typically drop the center ceiling. We'll, use, we'll, we'll send electrical and, and plumbing down those uh, above the ceiling. And we'll do some <coughs> wonderful work with, uh, with uh, <coughs> uh, 
columns and raised panels and chair rails and, and uh, uh, cornice to make these hallways spectacular. On the outside of the building, I'm going to blow this up a little bit. This is a building in Cambridge. Uh, you can see my hand moving the mouse. This is a building in Cambridge. On the outside of these buildings, uh, we typically, in the <coughs> buildings, repoint them. In, in, in wooden buildings, reface them with durable materials. In this particular building, you can see we had to replace. We had to replace all of the cornice all the way around. We had to change all the corbels. This is this is just the, some of the process of what's happening there. And we do things that we're not required to do. And I want this this to come into this conversation so you understand what we plan to do with the 101 to 103 Moore Street building. That cross was given to a church that happens to be my father-in-law's church. He's the pastor of that church. That sign, we removed that sign, which was the Catholic Archdiocese High School sign. We removed it. The Ellis School sign was present because it was originally built as a municipal school called the Ellis School. And that sign was, was placed in the back of the building and has a prominent place to capture some of the 50-year history of the Archdiocese owning that building. Uh, the building next to it is in, is in some of them. <coughs> that building had uh, 60 years of deferred maintenance when we, when we obtained it. Uh, we cleaned it up, removed all the ivy, repointed the whole thing, restored, it all, restored all, of the, uh, all of the stone. I have a down view there. I hope you can appreciate some of what's happening there in the down view. Uh, the, um, the landscaping is special. I designed all that landscaping myself in AutoCAD. The red is all pavers. All of the landscaping is granite. The landscaping is actually uh, terraced granite, and we created beautiful shapes, and all the way around the building, we have wonderful outdoor spaces for this apartment building. And then to the bottom left, uh, that is Paul Lavelle. Paul Lavelle works with us from the Jordan Institute. I'm not sure if you've ever worked with him, but this is how we accomplish energy uh, 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 certifications. Paul is doing a vacuum test on one of the units and trying to get one of these adaptive reuse buildings to actually meet LEED certification is not easy, but this is the dedication that we commit ourselves to. The court now seeks to extend its experience in the adaptive reuse of the 1871 historic Dalby knitting mill structure, the oldest wood frame mill in Watertown. The property is approximately a 31,000 square foot lot with a 36,000 square foot, uh, 36,000 four story building on it. While it is technically in the T zoning district, it is only flanked by seven houses. It's kind of in the outskirts of the living homes uh, district and this vicinity map kind of expresses that. If I blow this up a little bit, so just to give you further vicinity context, we're south of the Charles, uh, we are flanked by uh, Watertown Street and Galen Street, uh, and then we are here on Moore Street. Walking around the property, uh, we have the street, we have the parking lot, we have a uh, single family home here, we have a commercial building across the street, uh, we have a park, behind it we have a park. There's a home underneath this canopy of trees, there, this is a, a preschool, so it's a commercial building. This is a home. This home is owned by Watertown Housing. These are some site pictures that also help a bit in context. Looking at these site photos in relation to the lot, it is quite noteworthy that the parts of the property that are near to homeowners is actually only two and a half stories tall and is in keeping with the two-family zone in terms of massing and windows. In fact, the majority of the massing and the windows of the property are not on the property line facing home homeowners. Most of the massing of the windows are internalized or along the parking lot, along the forested area, the or abutting the commercial properties. Let's just walk through that a moment. So if we start, if we start by just taking a stroll down uh, uh, Moore Street towards Watertown Street, this is the first you see of the property. This does not, this, 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 this does not scream 36,000 square foot building. It, it is more in keeping with a two family structure. As we go into the front of the building, you can see that its size is about two and a half stories. 
We're now crossing over into where we can view the courtyard. And as we look at the courtyard, we can see that the majority of the windows are facing each other. They're not really facing the neighbors. This is, this is important because it affects how we look at light pollution in the two-family uh, zone. As we continue to walk down Moore Street, we see a two and a half to three story structure where the mansard begins. And the real massing of the building where that real 36,000 square feet starts to be visible is actually in the parking lot. So while the building is large overall, it is smaller in all the right places, so to speak. And, it, and this helps the light pollution considerations and the adaptive reuse because it is already in keeping with the two family lighting at night where it abuts two family homes. Now, I'd like to refresh your memory a little bit on previous applications. In 2017 and 2018, the prior owner of 101 to 103 Moore Street attempted to obtain approvals for the adaptive reuse of the, pro of the property from commercial to residential use, first by applying for 48 units, and then gradually reducing down his final application was for 36 units. In 2018, the prior owner withdrew his application and was forced to sell the property due to financial endurance limitations. While this is a new special permit finding application on this property, your board has already seen this project and recommended conditional approval at each application. The prior owner struggled at the zoning board and not the planning board. And I want you to know that I have already extensively studied the prior applications, read numerous reports on the project, and watched many hours of zoning board video related to the prior owner struggle through the special permit finding process that ended in application withdrawal. As such, I've already incorporated all of the input from the various staff members and board members into the current plans, and this is truly a better and more compelling plan. The more significant difference between the prior and current application relates to the following areas. Affordable housing, I was more generous. Historical character, the prior application had no plan to showcase the property's history. Quality of the project, the quality of our work is far superior to the prior plan. Community improvements, we are doing more. New improvements, our plan is simply better. Community impact mitigation solutions have been incorporated. And other responses and improvements to ZBA members, we have responded to everything requested. I'd like to take a moment to say something about affordable housing and historical character before we delve into the plans. On affordable housing, the Watertown Zoning Ordinance requirement is 15% affordable housing for a multifamily project of this type. In the last 2018 iteration of this project, the prior owner proposed 36 residential units, which rounded down to five affordable units. Today's proposal is for 37 residential units, which rounds up to six affordable units. So that extra unit place is 100% affordable. To quote the Watertown Housing Partnership Chairman Fred Reynolds, I have never seen any, application, any applicant intentionally choose a unit count that rounds up the affordable unit in their project. The housing partnership is very happy with the units we are getting, end quote. On historical ca character, the 1879 view of Watertown Mass map shows both the historic Mansard Roof Mill building and its historic waterways, the Boyd and Cook's ponds, as I mentioned earlier, and an aqueduct bridge that connected them. The ponds are gone today. I'm going to blow that up again. But I want you to remember this picture because I'm going to be trying to capture that in this project. The ponds are gone today and are now low-lying depressions known as Boyd Park and Casey Park. And the parking lot at this building. Most of the buildings in this picture are also gone. It is quite noteworthy that no other presently existing building can be identified by the petitioner in the 1879 map. This property represents the oldest fabric in its neighborhood and one of the oldest in Watertown. Its rich history should be showcased in its adaptive reuse. Our goal is to dust off this mill building and tell its story and tell the story of the waterways that are, that are now playgrounds. To that end, <clears throat> the petitioner intends to create three outdoor plaques and numerous indoor displays, such as that 1879 map, blown up maybe six feet by six feet, to capture the rich history of this property and the waterways that are now represented by the land depressions. The street plaques, which are shown in this panel, 
would be basically mounted onto 36 inch uh, diameter uh, boulders and, uh, and there would be two of them placed in the area of where that bridge was. One more plaque would be placed at the 101 side directly on the building since there is no landscaping area to place that. The middle plaque speaks of the 1871 mill structure. The right plaque speaks of the 1885 structure and the left one speaks of the bridge and waterways. Additionally, a prominent and unusual black steel railing will be placed and that's a picture of that railing. That's actually located right now in Winchester and it is on top of a waterway. That steel railing will have arches in it as you can see. Now what you can't appreciate in this picture is that railing is actually six inches deep. Six inches deep. Okay. Why? Think. Yeah. Not sure which dimension, so I'm going to use hands. <laughs> deep. Uh, and, it is, and, and those arches are really reminiscent of an aqueduct, and I believe that's why Winchester actually placed that there. And we will, use, we will replace the current aluminum black railing along Moore Street to capture a feeling of a waterway under the bridge. This is a, this is a 3D drive-by or walk-by view. And you can see that railing. You can also see some historical bollards there. And, the, and, and what you can see in the, in the, um, next to one of the bollards is a lookout area that maybe a child or adult could walk and stand on. And that would actually look out onto the parking lot. That, and, and the purpose of this, in combination with the plaques, would be to capture three historical concepts. A, the parking lot was underwater when it was Cook's Pond. B, the existing Mansard building was present on the shore of that historical pond. And C, the lookout where the observer is standing was itself a waterway aqueduct bridge. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I have four kids. And for me, taking my kids and trying to explain to them how time changes, I, I find that pretty interesting. And I look forward to my kids standing there. And I believe kids walking down the street and their parents stopping and just saying, this is how times have changed. It's kind of neat, and it really, it really creates a richness to the fabric of our community that really links the ages to the present. Additionally, while the exterior of the property will be greatly improved, its structure and fenestrations will be minimally altered so as to protect the utilitarian origins of the building for viewing by posterity, by posterity. So as we get into the plans, please keep in mind that this is not just an apartment building. It is a historical experience that will be a contribution to this neighborhood and to Watertown, offering historical charm and educational glimpses to the site's original industrial fabric. Let's move on to the plans. So this is the proposed site plan. And I have blow-ups of this, but I do want to point some things out so that you can see the whole thing as a whole. Can you see as I move my mouse here? OK, great. great. So this is the courtyard area, and this is the parking lot. To begin with, the parking lot entrance uh, is deficient in its width. We're going to be changing its width to be more of a standard street width, so it's 22 feet wide. It's going from 18 to 22 feet wide. Next to that parking lot, there is going to be a set of stairs installed so that neighbors or residents can come off the sidewalk, down the stairs, and get all the way over to the park, to Casey Park. They'd come down the stairs, around the sidewalk, down the ramp, and when they get to about here, and I'll show this more in the landscaping plan, when they get to about here, they're actually on asphalt. Why? Because these are parking spaces. But when they get onto the asphalt, what we will be doing is burying uh, uh, granite curbing so that it's flush with the surface of the, of the asphalt, creating basically a, a, a corral, so to speak, for people to know where they're supposed to be walking so that they're not just walking straight out into the middle of the parking lot. We have bike parking here, here, and here. Next to that, uh, the uh, stairs, there is a trash uh, area. That trash area is being changed from the previous plan, which is a dumpster plan. We actually prefer to use totes in our, in our projects. Totes are quieter. And in this particular case, it lends to having an extra parking space. We were able to put another parking space here because we didn't need to have access to a dumpster by a, uh, by a, a, a dump truck, a, a garbage truck having to back into it. So he can just pull those, that, that trash out, which we've privately done, by the way. 
you can pull that trash out and load it that way. And of course, we have a trash management plan that would protect the times so that it's not disturbing neighbors. Uh, we, we have uh, a bike area here, here, and here. We have uh, a handicapped parking. There's also a handicapped parking space in the far end of the, uh, of the property. I should take a moment to say that there's a line here that segments this site plan. To the left of the line is a parking easement. You may remember that from prior applications, for the prior applications, which I'll get into momentarily. And overall, the proposed site plan has 40, 40 car parking space, 40 car parking for 37 units. And there's also one shadow parking space that we didn't feel we needed. We will keep it if we need it, but we don't feel we need it. Note that this 40 car parking is on the, on, on the LaCourt property. That's not included, that's not part of the easement. The easement is an additional 14 spaces, which in the prior applications was 15 spaces, and we reduced it to 14 spaces because we were being responsive to uh, uh, individuals at the developers meeting that asked us to place a handicapped space at the end for somebody who wants, a handicapped person who wants to get into <coughs> Casey Park. Looking more closely at the parking easement, uh, I should say to you that the parking easement is, uh, is is a bit fluid right now. We're waiting for the attorneys representing the city to organize some uh, documentation on how they want to organize the easement. But by and large, the plan is to have the easement uh, mutually used by the tenants of the building as well as by the neighbors. In prior uh, video that I had the opportunity to watch, the, the zoning board made some great suggestions about how to make that parking easement easier and more visible to people from the street so that they knew that it was there since it's all the way in the back of the property and some of the suggestions that they made have already been incorporated here and those suggestions are while the property owned by LaCourt will be striped white on those spaces the easement spaces will be striped yellow additionally there will be signs placed at every space and those signs will also be yellow Additionally, there'll be a larger, larger sign placed at the entrance of the property where that 22-foot ramp is that is, that is um, uh, referring to those yellow signs. So these, there, are, there's a lot of, there are a lot of visuals that help a person pick up that they have the opportunity to use those, to use the parking easement. And then the signs themselves, uh, this is placeholder language that we will work through with the attorneys, but it's essentially saying that the, um, the for public use, it's able to be used 6 p.m. to 7 a.m. daily and snow emergencies and Dolby resident use all other times. Uh, this is the landscaping plan, which I have colorized. All that I would point out in the landscaping plan is that as part of the landscaping plan, at the very end of the parking easement, we have added a couple of fallers and a walking path, which right now does not exist. It's simply a muddy path. In the colorized version, uh, I'd like to just go straight to some blow-ups. In the courtyard, <clears throat> we have, uh, to access the courtyard, we do have steps, and we also have a handicap accessible ramp. And the courtyard has been, the courtyard has been uh, covered beautifully, in my opinion, with some nice red pavers. Additionally, those pavers are um, bounded by granite curbing, and we have uh, wonderful uh, plantings, which you can take the time to read. When I'm sure you don't want me to go through that. In the parking lot area, uh, you can get, I think, a little bit of an appreciation of the different colors here. We have greens and reds. Uh, notice that the, um, the trash area, which I didn't point out earlier, is actually covered by a trellis. I should probably try You might have bumped the HDMI cable. You might be fine with this. No, it's coming. It's fine for the next page. I don't know, but I. Okay, that seems fine now. Okay. So while you're stopped there, what are these uh, pink circles? Uh, those are trees. So they're named out as, uh, so that's an emperor red Japanese maple. 
And so, yes, we have, we have a variety of different colors. We have reds and greens and yellows, and we take a lot of pride in, in producing a very nice landscaping plan. I'll also note to you that uh, there is a stockade fence uh, abutting the neighbor, and in front of that stockade fence, we have, uh, we have Arbor Vitae. I have been a little bit in dialogue with that neighbor. We're thinking about bumping that fence back a little bit. Let me explain to you briefly why. The neighbor is encroaching on the LaCourte property in this area. LaCourte is encroaching on the neighbor's property in this area. This goes back many, many years. Uh, either party could make a case for adverse possession. Neither party wants to. I think the fair thing to do, and it was actually Mr. Higgins' suggestion, and I'm totally good with it, is whatever amount of space he's occupying here, we will occupy that same amount of space here, and that's going to set our fence back about to about two and a half feet away from the front bumper of a park of that uh, from the curbing essentially, which will give us room to create um, to create greens there. They may not be arborvitae; they may be climbing hydrangea, but it'll be green. And the landscaping uh, plan of the easement is not very substantial. But as you can see, the, you, it kind of points out the delineating, uh, the, the walking path and the path to Casey Park. I'm not going to go through all of the floors with depth, no. but I will go through certain floors a little more deeply. Uh, this is uh, level zero, uh, which is basically the parking lot level. Uh, and there are four units in, in this left building here, which three of which are, uh, are duplexed and one of which is not. That one which is not is a handicapped accessible unit, which makes sense because it's the handicapped parking is sitting right there, and that's a one in 12 ramp to get into that, that handicapped accessible area. And we also made a back exit for that, uh, for that unit so that they can get into the amenities such as laundry and storage for convenience. Additionally, we have an exercise room. We have a housekeeper's quarters and office. Uh, and we have uh, 37 storage lockers. We also have a, uh, a common uh, use bathroom. I'm going to blow up a little bit of the entrance. Inside the entrance, as I mentioned uh, in my introduction, we'll be having historic displays. And again, in my view, is having a six by six image of what I was showing you earlier. And we have many other images, but that is, in my opinion, the most compelling that I have so far. Uh, these kinds of images allow a tenant to really appreciate the building as more than just housing. Uh, additionally, uh, the, uh, the developers meeting uh, suggests, at the developers meeting there was a suggestion that we do put uh, moving and drop off rules so that uh, individuals know not to be dropping off their, dropped off by an Uber necessarily at the front. We want to create some structure so that they know what we ex where we expect drop offs to occur, pickups to occur, and moving trucks to be parked uh, for access. So let me ask you a general yes, question sir. here. You're showing fairly detailed plans. Some of us have seen this building on three or four different occasions. Is this a total gut? Are you tearing down everything inside and starting from scratch, or is some of this existing? We can't tell what's new and what's existing from the drawings. Most of the walls are being removed. I believe only two columns are being replaced, are being repositioned. So. Okay, so the floor finish of the windows are remaining? I'll go through that, but there are, there are probably a handful of windows that are staying, yeah. uh, that, are, that, are, that, are, that are changing, yeah. and the majority are staying. And so, that's really, the intent of that is, uh, as I had mentioned in my introduction, the intent of that is to protect the utilitarian history of that building. I can put in large no, windows. I understand, I understand. But I mean, as you look at, for instance, level three, we can't tell if that's all brand new or none of it is brand new. We just can't tell. So I think the zoning board is going to want to know that too, probably. There are existing plans in this, in your plan set? Well, I'm not sure of that. Just well, if it's at level three, I guess that means existing, yeah. But, all right, but it's not up to us to figure out each line. So the question is, if the new construction isn't shown except that it's, it's all shown. Yes. See what I'm getting at. At a glance, you can't tell what's new and what isn't. That's all. Right, because to, to, to. So I'm asking for that kind of, I mean, normally we understand that in a drawing that's presented. In this case, we can't. This could have been a paint job. 
You know, I mean, you can't tell that they're new walls. That's my point. So the scope isn't, I understand what you're doing, but the scope isn't as clear as it might be. So, so I so appreciate you what you're saying. you just have to address that when you go to yes. the zoning board. Yes, I appreciate all. what you're saying. If you were to look, if you were to take a moment to look at the other plans, which I can get to in a moment, if you were to look at the, at the existing plans, you're going to see that this is, this is a skeleton. I mean, the building, if I get to that, if the... Let's take a big one. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. There, there is everything is being removed. Except for except for the structural columns, so these are columns. Okay, everything else is being removed, except for the outside walls. So the so the the shell is staying the same, and everything structural yeah. inside yeah. is being. Removed. All right. Yeah. I'm just saying. You know, you show a finished plan, you can't tell what's. Sure. It could be the same units, you know, with new new numbers. I mean, it, it, it's, without look, studying each one of those sheets, it's hard to figure that out. That's sure. all. Can I, I'd like to let you finish the presentation. I just peg, piggybacking on piggybacking onto that question before I lose my train of thought. Um, so in your in the elevations, it shows every floor being exactly ten feet, like ten feet, twenty feet, thirty feet. Is that just a coincidence, or was it like a just an easy way to do the what I assume is a Revit model, or are there? Like you're the floors. About, you're, you're not talking about the Revit elevations. You're talking about the, the uh, so like A200. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So they just happen to all be at. Uh, well, I guess what I'm getting at is, uh, is your architect here this evening? No. Because I, I do have a couple of questions as it pertains to this. I haven't finished yet, and we haven't heard a staff report, so I we ought to. Uh, okay. I, I didn't mean to interrupt, but uh, I, I did. Go, so go ahead. Uh, you can finish, and I'll Continue. pick that up after. Okay, so let me blow that back up. Okay, so looking again at this plan, uh, we, we've talked about the historic displays, and we've talked now, you go through this door here, and you're into the elevator, and then we've got some bike room space here as well, and I think that largely covers this floor. I think I said, I think I mentioned the exercise room. Okay, moving to the next level. The next level allows us to access the, uh, the courtyard, uh, and so people coming from the the parking lot would be coming through coming up the elevator. And we have the elevator organized and the, and the hallway is organized so that it's pretty easy access. You may not remember from the previous plan, but there were some really complicated um, uh, designs for the units uh, in this corner of the, uh, of the development. I think we've done a very good job and we've got some great positive feedback from the planning staff on what we can do with these, with these units. You'll notice that there's an accessible unit here and it, we, we put it close to the elevator. There's another accessible unit over here. Speaking of accessible units, uh, this building is subject to group 2A uh, requirements at the AAB, and we are only required to have two accessible units, but we chose to have four accessible units for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is that we were being responsive to the affordable housing uh, request, which has a, floatable, a floating affordable housing unit uh, system, which I'm sure you're aware of, and in the case where uh, uh, someone in an affordable housing, in, a, in an affordable designated unit becomes above income requirements, they want to be able to switch to another unit, but they have a lot of handicapped accessible needs, and so they ask us to put some extra ones in, just ex extra uh, accessible units in to allow them to have that flexibility for their affordable units. We were happy to comply with that. Um, additionally, you'll see, and I will blow this up a little bit, some of the interesting things we did were we just didn't, we don't treat these hallways as I showed you in some of the pictures. We don't treat these hallways as just functional space where people have to get from one place to another. We have some seating here. We have a foyer here so they come in the door and we've got some, some, uh, some uh, uh, thermal blocks uh, to control the air. And we have historic displays. And again, we have those uh, moving and drop off rules. This is really kind of more of the same, but I think, and I don't think I need to walk you through this. I know that you're, I know your professional background is, um, but this is nine units on level two, and level three has uh, 12 units, a few of which duplex into uh, level four. Level four is only a small area. Uh, if you were to go back to the pictures, you would see that level four is basically um, just the gable area of the, of the 101 side of the building. 
And in that gable area, if you look here, there are some existing dormers. We are not doing any additions to the building. We're not adding any dormers, but we are adding some skylights. And so we can get a look at the skylights here. Uh, these skylights are uh, far smaller than the previous skylights that were proposed. I personally felt that the previous skylights that were proposed were quite disproportionate. I feel like these are a little more tame and give us the light that we need. Uh, there are seven skylights here. There's only one skylight on the mansard roof, which would not be seen from the street. That light is necessary because there's no other way to have gotten light into the bedroom underneath that. What's also noteworthy in this picture is that we have 50 compressors uh, on the roof that are buried, that have uh, an a 48-inch acoustical barrier around them. And we are confident that we'll be able to get to about a 40 or less decibel rating on the street. Keep in mind that uh, Closest buildings to, this, to these compressors are, is the building right here, which is a commercial building. There is a residential building right here. That residential building, however, is further protected by the gable itself, which rises 15 to 20 feet above the, uh, the compressors, the condensers. Uh, we also removed some of the condensers that were on this, uh, the lower area here to get them on the roof uh, because they were an eyesore and it would help with noise. Uh, getting to the elevations, you can see again the, and we call out very specifically what is new and what is not new, uh, and what has been removed, for example. So, just as an example, uh, in, in the Morse Street uh, right side, 101 right side elevation, uh, I'm calling out three new windows where one has been removed. And again, this is compelling only because that's the only way to get the proper lighting inside of those spaces. More of the same, I don't feel like I need to go through this unless you ask me to, but I do want to be respectful of your time. And then we've got some three-dimensional uh, models that demonstrate all of this. And then we get into the, um, the existing plans. And rather than go into the existing plans, I'd like to point out a few things. This is the 2016 uh, existing site plan that was uh, presented to you previously. In the 2016 plan, it notes that the entire lot is included in an area of activity and use limitation. There is an activity and use limitation on this property related to the DEP. I want you to know we've been working uh, with, uh, with DEP and we've already, just two weeks ago, we reduced the activity and use limitation uh, to just the building and we're going to be further reducing it to only a section of the building and we'll then handle that uh, quite, can't, quite easily with uh, just vapor mitigation such as radon system. This is a lighting plan. Uh, looking at some of the engineering plans, these are the existing conditions shown by the engineer. This is a utilities plan. Of note, what's noteworthy on this plan is really that the truth is that the property already has a very robust stormwater system. Uh, it has a, uh, uh, what it doesn't have is an irrigation system. And so what we're going to be doing is tying into that existing stormwater system and putting it in a 3,000-gallon irrigation cistern, which, help, which will help with our energy efficiency. And that will keep our plants nice and happy. Uh, these are proposed conditions. I've already gone through with you that we are widening the, uh, the entrance. And I think the details are, are pretty much uh, laid out there. This is the access plan which relates to the fire department and this plan complies with the uh, state uh, fire code and we've already vetted this in the state fire line. I think whatever is left is really more responsive to your comments and questions and so I don't feel like I need to particularly go further. I thank you for your time. I hope you were pleased so far with what you've seen. So, we have a staff report. Thank you for the record, Andrew Adams, Senior Planner. Mr. Zuccala was very um, thorough in explaining the project, so I just want to point out a few things. Again, the nature of the quest is a special permit finding from the Zoning Board of Appeals, as he noted, to change the use from the existing non-conforming to another non-conforming use. It's commercial now, and it would be non-conforming because it's the T-zone, so it's going from that to residential multifamily in the existing building. They're going to maintain the existing structure, which is also important because in a, the last couple of go-rounds, the um, 
Historical Commission, even though they didn't have purview over the site because it wasn't going to be demolished, expressed concern about any alterations to the roof, um, meaning actual changes to the mansard area or any other uh, changes to the pitch of the roof. Uh, he's not doing that in this particular um, configuration. He's adding skylights, which is going to leave the bulk of the roof intact. So. Uh, there's no issue. That was already vetted in one of the prior designs when the prior owner attempted to put in skylights. Um, in terms of public comments, uh, they had um, an informational meeting in June. Um, a summary has been provided to the board. It included things like encroachments, sight lines, snow management, green space, parking management, the uh, off-site parking concerns, deliveries and decreased property values. We did receive two comments, I believe, from uh, in addition that should have been provided to the board. Both were positive. In terms of the um, various findings that have to be made, the first is planned consistency, and staff found that it is consistent, changing the commercial retail use to a residential use even though it is multifamily, because the building reuse is more in keeping with the character of the surrounding neighborhood. Um, the special permit finding test is, again, that such change, extension, or alteration shall not be substantially more detrimental than the existing nonconforming use, structure, or building to the neighborhood. So from that perspective, we believe that it's um, important to note that this was conditionally met in a variety of ways. First, the number of rental units is going to be 37. That's a positive. Um, it's a residential use. Um, as allowed, if you looked at the parking demand, it would require 49 spaces. Under the scenario, the site could request a 25% reduction um, and is uh, showing under the scenario 37 spaces. The site plan indicates 40 plus one shadow space. So the site will have at least one spot per unit and four extra spaces, which is in keeping with the ordinance for new construction of residential. The other thing is he uh, showed a parking analysis, which indicates that it meets zoning requirements. Um, and they also look at opportunities for public transportation nearby, including Watertown Square and Newton Corner in particular. Um, in terms of trip generation, there's a significant decrease in all trip types, including daily vehicle and peak hour trips from the existing uh, commercial uses. Um, there was also a transportation demand management program provided, and Watertown's <coughs> ordinance doesn't require it for this type of use, but they're going to provide it anyway, which includes various different things such as a Charlie card for adult renters, car share space, wayfinding, welcome packages, carpooling, and some other things. Um, in terms of site design, the um, throat of the entrance will be widened, which was a significant concern, although we note the relocation of any fire hydrants will be subject to Department of Public Works and Fire Department review. Um, in terms of the um, uh, publicly owned part of the site, which was a, a paper street, that is still underway with the town's uh, local council, uh, but good progress is being made. In terms of landscaping, we note that um, Mr. Zakala would like to evoke a riverine feel given uh, where this uh, building originally stood. Uh, the plan currently calls replacing all the uh, trees on the Moore Street frontage. We did have the town's uh, tree warden look at the trees along the frontage. They are in, uh, if I can use a colloquialism, decent condition, although they've been recently pruned in a rather severe manner. Um, some of the trees he indicated that might become a problem in the future because of their growth habit are the ones close to the existing sign on the property at the beginning of the curb cut that goes down the ramp and the 
um, one other tree on the property. Um, we believe that it would be appropriate to retain them, subject to a review, again, by the forestry supervisor. Um, we note that they have to do a sanitary assessment and will be required to remove a amount of infiltration inflow um, in accordance with the town requirements and the project's been conditioned um, to that effect. In terms of affordable housing, he did a very good job describing the fact that he's providing one more than would be required. There's going to be two income tiers. One is going to be offered for rent at 65% area median income, and five will be offered at 80%. Uh, they will be required to do a local initiative petition in order to get them on the state's um, housing inventory. Um, there is a preliminary uh, breakdown in the staff report as reviewed by the housing partnership. Um, I would note that of the initially designated affordable units, there's a requirement in zoning that they have a certain percentage um, with respect to the market rate units. Um, in this case, a significant proportion, if not all of the units, are undersized and smaller than DHCD minimums. In the affordable unit cases, only two are smaller than the minimum size. Um, but since the project overall is a conversion, uh, we've asked this question of the Department of Housing and Community Development before. We will allow the units, if undersized, to count on the town's subsidized housing inventory um, because the majority of the units in the project are also similarly disadvantaged. Uh, you know, so it's not just the affordable units that are undersized. <coughs> Based on this, in total, <coughs> staff recommends conditional approval of the requested change, and the conditions are laid out in a matrix that um, some of which are standard, such as recording the decision, and some of which are unique, such as uh, review by the uh, Department of Public Works of the stormwater system. That concludes the staff report. Great. Thank you. So are there comments, questions from board members? No. Jason can start, I guess. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I, I was very impressed with the presentation that you made and it seems like you've put a lot of thought into this and effort and research and uh, <clears throat> you know that should be acknowledged so just wanted to thank tell you, you I, I think it, it seems like you re really have good intentions for this property. Um, I want to ask you just a couple of things. It, it, again, just to pick up on the last question. So y your architect is, is not here this evening. Right. It's a different architect than the previous one. Yes, D.F. Valenti is my architect. Okay. Um, a lot of the, the drawings kind of look very similar to the way they were before, so I'm not sure if, like, they, if he started from scratch or just kind of like picked up on some of the things that were working in the previous one. I, I think it's the same number of units as the one that was withdrawn from the ZBA. Um, well, I mean, it's the same building, right? So the plans are going to be, the, the, certainly a lot is going to be similar. Yeah. But no, in fact, I have to tell you, um, when we looked at the plans, not to be, I want to say this carefully, previous plans ripped the place apart, okay? If you overlaid their plan on the existing structure mm -hmm. and looked at where the columns are, they removed all the columns. Mm -hmm. I did notice that the first time around. It was around. shocking. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I, I, so I can assure you, these are very different. These actually work. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, I, looking at it from an architect's eye, there's some weirdness in some of the plans. I think as they get refined, there may be some issues to work out, but that's not really the, the purpose of this, of this hearing. Um, I guess one, another thing I wanted to say is that it looks like you've put a lot of attention and thought into sort of the site-related historic preservation, like with the plaques and the boulders and, and all of that. I'm wondering if you, it, it, the, the building facades still look very plain. And I'm wondering if you had any intention, I don't know if there's existing photos that would corroborate this or kind of like suggest that there might be some ornamentation to restore, like cornices or 
brackets or anything like that. It just, it's still, it, it might just be the style in which the drawings are done but it still kind of looks like it could be the same vinyl siding that exists today with really no more ornamentation. So I'm wondering what your thought is about that. So I, I, the truth is with these projects, and I know you've done these kinds of projects, with these projects, sometimes you discover things mid-project and you may have to make some changes. Ultimately, my, my understanding of the, of the property is it was a very, very utilitarian building. This is lap siding. Mm -hmm. As we start to uncover things, if we start to discover things that we can actually bring to the surface, we're going to do that. If I could justify putting a beautification bracket that's actually that's attractive but is truthful mm -hmm. to the history of the building, I'm going to do that. And I would I would actually love it if we have that as you know as as we go into the conditions conversation. I would like those to be something that that the staff can approve because these minor things. They shouldn't be burdens to a person properly historically uh, um, restoring buildings. These should be something that we could do at the staff level and say, hey, Andrea, I see this bracket here, and I think I found, based on this picture, I can put that here, and this is just going to be wonderful for the building. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a great intention, I'm, I'm, and obviously these things cost money to do, so to hear I'm not you concerned say about that. I have to tell you, we're in a, we're, our company is at a place where we just, we just want to do cool things. That's kind of where we're at. Great to hear. Um, thank you. Uh, so just a couple of other small things. Um, 50 condensing units on the roof. What, why do you need so many more than there are units, aside from the public areas? It just seems like, do, do you need that many? I, I assume you won't put in more than you need. but Right. Well, so if I say 37 plus a handful for public areas, and I find that we're not getting enough um, conditioning in certain public areas. I don't want to have to come back to the board mm -hmm. for that. So if I ask for 50 and I, and I end up being at 47, I'm in a safe place. Yep. It, when, I, when we did the math, we felt that 50 was the limit of what we would need. And we're not, we're not interested in you know, pretending. We don't want to come back to the board and ask for something that's you know, a minor add-on. Okay, so that, that extra capacity is, is intentional and was had an engineer kind of yes. look at it oh, yes. and suggest that. Okay, that's good. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention, um, the concept of this walkway that goes through the site, I think is a, is a great idea. And I'm really hoping that people would avail themselves of that. I, I don't think people know that there's parking back there, first of all, or that there's a way to Casey Field through the site. I, I tried once recently and you had to sort of like go through brush and stuff like that. Yes, right. Um, the fact, though, that it, it goes so close to the entrances to those townhouses, like right in front of their doors and windows, I'm not sure that's going to... I think that may discourage people from using it as much. I don't know what the alternative is, but do you know what I mean? It's kind of like literally right by people's front doors, so if there's any way that that path might skirt a little further away from those, those units, I think it would be more likely to be used by the I public. would love to do that, but the fact is that I don't see, looking at the site plan, and I'm intimately familiar with that site plan. I've stared at that quite a bit. You would lose a variety of things if you did that. And it seems to me that it seems to me that, you know, if you're going to occupy, if you're going to take that unit, you know, you understand what that is. And you can appreciate that this is a, you know, it's somewhat of a suburban, urban feel, right? So the person who's going to occupy that unit is going to kind of, I live, where I live, you know, there's a lot of traffic and there's a lot of foot traffic. And for me, it's enjoyable. So for different, it's different for different people. But I, I, I'm not counterpointing you as much as I'm saying it's a balance of, what do you gain, what do you lose? And I, I guess I'd like to know how strongly you feel about that. Well, I, to your point, and I kind of knew this when I asked the question, I don't know that there's any other way to do it. I would just say that, like, let's not get too attached to that idea as, like, a major selling point to it, because I just don't think, realistically, it's going to be used as much. I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, 
One last question I have. So um, are you going for LEED uh, certification? Until we open it up, we don't know. Mm -hmm. you, you, you end up opening it up, figuring out what the complexity is to do that. We do like to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful as an accolade. It's also wonderful as a, um, as in marketing a rental unit. You know, and for our, and our feelings are that we want to get to that level just because we just believe in energy efficiency. And when you're getting that close to it, doing a little bit more to get there is great. But until you open it up and you understand what you have in those walls and what those, what, what, what the sills look like, how, how, how do you seal that up? You know, you, you, sometimes you have gaps between the outside wall and, and, the, and, and the floor that are just so big and you don't know how to close it. You would have to rip everything apart to get there. Does that make sense? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Because I noticed you did have the image of the blower door test, and yes. I, I assume that indicates an intention on your part to at least try. Try. Oh, yes. Okay. And, and uh, if it works out, use it for marketing for your project that it's, you know, airtight and, you know, air, number of air changes per hour or whatever to appeal to people who really care about those things. And, and food smells. You know, mm -hmm. you walk into one of the lead buildings, and you've got, you've got smooth food smell controls. You know, where you don't really want to smell the, the, um, the Asian food if you don't feel like eating Asian next door, so, or the Indian cuisine. So, so it, it, does, it does translate into a better space. It's not just a check mark, a check box for us. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that's all I have. No. Thank you. Uh, oh, sorry. Anybody else? Yeah. yeah. I pretty much had one, two, three, same questions as Jason. Um, first, I want to commend you on your presentation, and, um, and I really appreciate that you studied the previous presentation so you knew what the points were and you've addressed them really well. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask about the siding and the detail as well. Um, I noticed you're replacing the siding with uh, fiber cement and there's some window trim shown, so it's already looking a little better. Um, I won't go there. And then I was going to ask also, um, and this is more a staff question, at what size does our, the newly passed lead and solar um, requirements kick in? As a, as a reuse building, it's not a requirement in, okay. in, in the T-zone. Um, so it, it's for a site plan review for, for n new construction. New construction. Um, okay. But we, we specifically that, you know, suggested that that would be a, a more difficult Mm -hmm. task for certain types of mm -hmm. construction right right and, and also because it's uh, existing structure and t-zone so it's a special permit binding um okay i hope this is the last presentation from moore street that we see <laughs> uh, thank you i was just and we don't talk before but i was gonna say it's obvious you've thoroughly studied the site's history and the, the development history as well and I want to commend you on going through that as well. Um, is the site currently occupied at all, or is it vacant? It's vacant. So there's no. I was when I was looking at the trip generation, and a big deal was made about a 230 percent decrease, and that's purely mathematical. Right now, there's zero trips if right. it's vacant, right? That's so, right. just to get that point out there. Um, in terms of the site plan, um, I too like the the uh, the concept of the walkway back to the park. To me, it, in, in the way you're doing it, it evokes the Harbor Walk in Boston. Um, looking at it from a, a site civil perspective, what I don't like and what makes me uncomfortable is the way it is backed up against those uh, six, ten parking spaces on the east side, if you want, or at the top of your plan. Um, it is right on the back of those. Cars are going to be faced, parked in, and backing out. It just it just seems like an accident waiting to happen, um, especially when you're talking about promoting young children walking back there that may not be seen by a driver. So I'd ask you to talk to your civil engineer and, and think about that a little bit more. Again, like Jason said, I don't know what the answer is, and um, but it, it is a concern that I'd ask you to, to take a, a look at. It's a concern for me, too. Yeah. If, I could, if I could help you make you so. feel better, because I kind of made myself feel better on it. When I walk my kids through a parking lot to go to the grocery store, that's the same thing. You know, and here, what we're trying to do is something better because we're creating a delineated path. So it is not, it's not perfect, I can tell you that. And I've tried many different ways to get there. And pretty much the only other option I've got is a bridge. 
But I, I kind of think this is where this is where we tap out, and we don't we don't have any further options. On I mean, even just moving it away from the parking space is just there's a little more visual. That, Maybe but four, four feet beyond. Um, yeah. One one suggestion: um, you, you could try to have that be back in parking. So try to get the people who use those parking spaces because it's assigned to have back in. Because then when yep. you leave, you're pulling out. Um, and then the other the other piece I just wanted to point out is that it is a residential project, so it's yep. not like a, a commercial shopping market um, right. parking lot where it's getting constant use. So. Yeah, but part of those are on the town land as well. Yeah, so that was are. part of my, yeah. my concern in there. Then I guess this is more, and maybe this is something for the uh, the easement discussion the town council has to go through, but the, there's a notation about having snow storage in the back corner, and that's on the, the town land, the paper street. So. I don't know how that gets handled, if it's allowed, um, or if another area for snow storage needs to be designated. I'll, I'll leave that to in the tra other. In the snow management plan, uh, we, it, it uh, clarifies where snow is going to be stored. Snow is going to be stored inside of the planters to begin with. The planters' uh, plantings are going to be Pacassandra, which are yep. very resistant to snow packing. I'm a huge fan of Pacassandra for these very reasons, and they're green all year. Yeah. So, My point um, was just more that it's town land. Yes, that but is, it will also be so. plowing town snow right. in that land. Right. Exactly. So. Not all of it is. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a cross-access easement, and we're, we'll work that out yep. and discuss that. Uh, th that was something that I did um, mention to our town attorneys just to see if there's a, okay. an issue with that. But it is a cross. It's, it is for the whole site, both, both sides. Right. So there, there could be an appropriate level of snow there, but... There was, there's a requirement if, if there's too much snow, then it wouldn't be able to be just mm -hmm. on the town property for the entire site. And on the, in the courtyard area, in your landscape plan, where you had the brick pavers in that, that appears like it's all impervious. And my question is, where is the stormwater going to go? Um, is there stormwater an Stormwater is all picked up. That, as I said earlier, the stormwater on the building, the, it, that building currently has a very robust stormwater system. And it covers that, that courtyard area, yeah, that small little totally courtyard area? It covers it. Okay, so that wasn't apparent today, from the plan. So. Yes, if you, if yeah. you were to walk, it's actually in the stormwater plan, though. Um, it shows the underground pipes. The only part of the building, the entire building, that is not picked up is actually the right side, the far right side wall of that two and a half story gable uh, uh, structure. Everything else is picked up. Right. Yeah, and DPWs. It looks like it's yeah, it's a, it, it, there's a very substantial existing, and that's yep. why. So we we didn't have him do everything be, because there's a lot of stuff that's just there because it's an existing condition. Um, so so the original project didn't go into the stormwater because they were planning on not doing anything to the parking lot. Yep. He, he's willing to uh, improve the parking lot, um, and so he's you know looking at that. But DPWs reviewed that, and that all, all the connections will have to be reviewed as part of the final yeah. um, building permit. And then lastly, just is your civil engineer isn't here either, I assume? He's not here. Um, just when I was looking at the plans, they were not properly endorsed by the professional engineer. Um, plan. Um, all of them. So You're saying his four plans? His four plans were not. As a PE myself, they were not properly endorsed. They were not properly endorsed. You mean there were a they number were that stamped? they were they had a stamp, they did not have a signature. The one that had a signature did not have a date, which is required. And then lastly, the signature obscures the seal, which is not allowed by the regulations. So just something your PE needs to, to fix. So, yep. Yep. Not what I want to be <laughs> standing up here. So, and, and, the obscured and, thing is just like the last thing. But the fact that they weren't signed, yeah. that's kind of sloppy. And I'll be so, on the phone with him tomorrow. Yeah, and I'm sure the zoning board would pick yeah. up on that as well. Yeah. So. No, that's, that's light duty stuff yep. that should just already be there. Yep. I'm sorry about that. Exactly. Yep. So I've got a couple of questions. Again, we all commend, commend you on the history and stuff. Some of us have seen this project come through here several times. So, Thank you. Um, the structure, I take it, is steel columns and wood framing? Uh, steel columns and wood framing. There are steel columns. There are steel uh, I-beams, uh, uh, horizontal I-beams. There's, there's, that's in the, that's actually. There's wood, too. Probably only one third of the building. The rest of the building is timber. What? Timber. Two thirds of the building is timber and not steel. I see. Yeah. Okay. And uh, is there a sprinkler system? Yes. Yeah. And it's functional and. Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, and, the property was actually fully renovated in yeah, 2003. Yeah. yeah. And what is a fibrex window? It's a fiberglass 
the part of the frame. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, these are all rentals. Yes. There's no condo option. No. No. And you intend to own it for a while? I mean, you keep your buildings? I've never sold a building in my life. I don't plan to. Okay. Good. Good. It's always worth asking. So are there uh, questions from anybody in the audience? Cool. No, oh, sir. Yes, um, um, please. Yeah, please, please um, introduce yourself, yeah, please. Uh, hi, uh, John Philly, 76 Capitol Street. Um, I had a question about uh, the totes that were uh, mentioned. Are those the um, tall wheel the trash things? Trash things that we're using in Watertown now. Is that right? Okay. So we're talking about putting 37 of these out on that street? No. On certain days? It's, it's not private. private. But where will they be put so that they'll be private? There is a trash uh, corral. Yeah, Somewhere in the park. It's on the plan. Yeah, I'll, I'll just explain. So the, the truck will drive down into the site and then they will go into the corral and roll the trash bins out to the truck? That's what you described to me, I think. Is that right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So he, that's what he was asking. I just wanted to clarify. All right. I, I thought they might yeah. put on the street. No. So, so, so the truck will go down the ramp, park, and the guy will go in, or the person will go in, grab the bins, bring it out, dump it, okay. bring it back in. Um, also, uh, if I'm allowed No. Okay. I, I believe this project will be detrimental to the immediate area as well as the water town in general. Uh, traffic considerations on Moore Street, it's the main artery between Galen and California. There's a park right across the street where kids normally play, it's getting a lot of heavy use and will be putting traffic for 37 families right opposite that park. Um, I just think it's it's time to say no. Thank you. Any other comments? Good evening. My name is Joan Vashon. I uh, live at 9395 Union Street which I own uh, with my husband. I've lived there 46 years. He's been there his whole life. I won't tell you how long that is. Um, I also co-own um, 100 Capitol Street Extension with my uh, daughter and son-in-law. So we're direct butters to the property. And we are anxious for something nice to be on this property. Over the years, there have been a lot of different functions some very noisy, some very traffic involved, some very not neighborly things. Uh, right now, the property is empty. We feel like it's not only an area where people congregate down at the bottom of the park there and what used to be the Parker School, but we also feel like an empty building is a attraction for animals, rodents, people, and also a fire hazard, an empty building. So we have a lot of concerns about what goes there. Uh, we like this plan. We've seen other plans for there. We've had a lot of things over the years, and we think that people being neighbors is a good thing. And I think that, you know, with regard to the traffic, 37 cars is a drop in the bucket of what goes on on Moore Street, so it, it's not going to make that much difference. And I just like to say that we are uh, support this plan. So, anyone else, sir? I shouldn't ask. You have to. Uh, <clears throat> my name is uh, Erminio Formato. Uh, Longtime resident of Watertown, homeowner. Um, I just want to understand 
we're going here from uh, a non-conforming situation to another non-conforming situation. Is that how this is working? Is that true? That's correct. That's correct. Uh, my, my question is, what would make this a conforming situation? For the record, Andrew Adams, the underlying zoning is T, two family. So in order to be conforming, theoretically, you would remove the building in toto and build consistent with the two family zone. And so you would build one two family there to make it you, conforming? Depending upon how big the lot was. Okay. How many times have you asked this question? What's that? How many times have you asked? You, there's at least two to three parcels. You could probably make it maybe six, six, two or three, two families, maybe but four. I, I You've asked this question. Yeah, no, so. I'm just trying to be, uh, understand the situation here. Yeah. Um, so my question is then, uh, why doesn't Watertown um, encourage a developer to make it conforming instead of non-conforming? Uh, because when we talk about what is more or less detrimental to the neighborhood, if it was conforming with everything else, there would be no detriments, right? I'm assuming. Uh, the, the, and as I've told, I've talked to you about this a couple of times, but the the mechanism in the ordinance for non-conforming structures and uses is to allow them to be converted and allow sites that are non-conforming to continue to have those protections that they had when they were first built and continue on. And so, your your arguments are yeah. So yeah, if the zoning says. If you were to build from scratch or if you tore it down without getting permission, you would have to rebuild conforming. But this is a protection, and although we didn't change the zoning, it's basically a site like the Bemis Mills on the other side of the river with zero setbacks. I mean, you, you look at all the old building, actually 50 to 80% of our two families are non-conforming, so we should tear them all down. I mean, this argument isn't, a good logical argument from that I'm perspective. No, I'm not talking about that we should have to tear all these things no, down. No, no. So, so the point is that a non-conforming structure in use has some protections, and it's in the ordinance and it's in state law. So you can't just say tear it down and make it be what the underlying zoning is, which is substantially less right. um, large than what is existing there. And, it's, and, and as it's been identified, it's been there for um, substantially longer than our zoning ordinance has been in place before zoning has had ever been conceived. So, so that's a summary. And I, I don't want to get from, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll hand it back over to Jeff um, yeah. Brown okay. for, yeah. So, I mean, one of the things we're doing is protecting some of the historic fabric here, which is of, of value, so. But the ordinance protects it, so it makes sense. Oh, can yeah. I just add, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. Do you want to speak? Um, well, the other thing to add is that it's private property. It's not public property. And the only way, there, there actually is not a way that the town could encourage a particular type of development on that site. Um, I'm not a developer, but I'm pretty sure that the financial side of building three two families on that site wouldn't work and wouldn't be attractive for anybody exactly. to go do. So therefore, rather than tear it down, this seems like a legal and reasonable process to go through to reuse the building. So, or, or worse yet, to just let it stay in its current situation yeah. because you can't demolish it and nobody's going to come in and build three two-family houses. So it's kind of like a market-driven thing also. Okay. I mean, what's, what, what do we really ultimately want for this parcel of land that's realistic, that, some, that a developer would come along and say, this makes financial sense, I'm going to actually do it, rather than having this building eventually like fall down. So again, we're going back to what makes financial sense for a developer and not exactly what makes sense for a neighborhood. I just wanted to re reiterate that a site that has a non-conforming structure like this is protected under the zoning ordinance. It's not about the financial sense or how it's redeveloped mm -hmm. or that the existing underlying zoning is T. Um, the Parker School is also zone T but we allowed a use variance for that site because it obviously wouldn't have been a good two-family. And, and so that, that's an adjacent property. So I just, I, I want to bring it back to the, the, the focus of this is about the findings. And if, if you're making a, you know, argument for the neighborhood, that's, you know, you, the public process. I just want to make sure from the ordinance perspective and the planning board that that's 
it's, it's about this site and what it is, not the theoretical reuse of it, which this neighborhood, there's almost no structure that is conforming. There's substantial numbers of not just two families, but three families, four families, one parking space, no parking space. I mean, this neighborhood is a very old neighborhood and it does not comply with zoning. The whole neighborhood, your, your neighborhood. Right. So, so, my so neighborhood. I'll hand it back to, I'm, I'm not having, I'm just providing that. So, <laughs> we need to move along. I, um, I mean, so, I, think I, I just need to say a few things because uh, we look at it in a lot of different ways from an engineering standpoint, from a historical standpoint, um, but we need to look at it also from uh, a neighborhood standpoint and the people that, some of the people that I know that live there also are concerned about 37 units. We're not concerned. It's not that we don't want to see it developed. We just feel that there's a lot of units there because I don't know if any of you guys live on Moore Street or Union Street or Capitol Street, probably not. And there might be less of a concern about traffic and that kind of thing. But what I want to say is that if you have a two-family house right across the street from this structure and 37 families are going in across the street from you, uh, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense either. No, except the building was there when, when whoever bought the house across the street. Right, and it was a business zone. Yeah. Before that. So I think it's we need to cut this off because it's well, why do we have to cut because this off? Uh, he's explained that the ordinance allows this to happen and it's there to protect the private owner. I understand. Is anything okay. to protect the neighborhood or no? So the whole zoning ordinance but, is to protect yeah, the neighborhood. Right. The zoning pro and, and how is it being protected? That's what I don't understand. So you can go to the zoning. Well, I don't board. understand because we have you know single family, two families, whatever. And you're living right across the street then from a 37 family house, right? Is, is that what this apartment building well, is? It's gonna look beautiful. I, I know Mo is gonna do a great job and everything like that, uh, but you have to see how it, what kind of sense it makes to the neighborhood and to the people that live there, not just to uh, <coughs> outsiders that are not living there. Uh, well, I don't know if anybody's gonna take that in consideration. If it was still the Corteva school, which we know how much traffic that generated and, and what a nuisance it was at times to the residents. Um, you know, we judge this objectively on the standards of is it sub substantially more detrimental. So I know it's vacant right now, and in a sense that's great for traffic, but, you know, we're just judging it on the basis of would this use be substantially more detrimental than uh, uh, what ma massage therapy school or whatever it was. And, and I think... I mean, even if you just look at the parking studies, it's substantially, not substantially more detrimental in that sense, and probably in some other ways, Are too. Are taking in consideration where that was a business, there was, like, no traffic there on the weekend. So it was only during the week, and it was only during certain times. So it wasn't a 24-hour thing. It wasn't pe weren't people living there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So that's a different type um, uh, of traffic. Maybe so, but it's fewer trips. I mean, that's... It's fewer trips. Is that a projection that they do? That you know they did? Is that, you know, yes. the reality yeah. of it is... Uh, I suspect this... The traffic study that... Gone on before, that has well, it? just for perspective, the traffic study that Mr. Zucala's engineer did did take into account the peak hour of the street and the peak hour of the project. So the peak hour of the street is when the street has the most traffic on it and what happens when the use in particular, his, partic his use, adds traffic to it. So when you look at the peak hour of the street mm -hmm. for the previous, uh, immediately previous use when it was operating and the peak hour of the street with the proposed use, you still get a decline. Oh, yeah. So it does take into account the periodicity of the use in terms of its parking and trip generation and the periodicity of the amount of traffic on the street. When you compare those two periods, even though they may be different in time given the nature of the use, i.e. Quotiva during the day because it was a school and a residential use perhaps on the weekends and at night, even taking into account those different periodicities, when you look at the raw data uh, type to type, there is a significant de decrease in trips, even when you, you take that into account and when you take into account the background growth on the street. So the metrics are objective and do look at the factors that you're suggesting. Okay. All right. 
like I said, I'm not um, against development. We, there's some of us that felt that 37 units was too many. That's all. Thank you. Appreciate you speaking up. So if there's no further comments, uh, we would entertain a motion, I believe. Okay. Um, I move that the planning board recommends to the ZBA conditional approval of the requested change from one non-conforming use to another non-conforming use as a special permit finding under section 4.06a as it meets the necessary criteria set forth in the Watertown Zoning Ordinance. Is there a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So, zoning board in two weeks. Thank you. And he, he may be there with you, but... Uh, so we have one other case? Um, one other item. One other issue, it's not a case. It's an item, yeah. Oh, two, two items. Yeah, well, no, just note that 19 Loomis, they, they did request a continuance to, to September, but I don't remember if at the last meeting we... I, I'm not hearing what you said. Um, Loomis, 19 Loomis was, they requested it to September, but I'm not sure if at the last meeting you continued it to September, so if you just okay. acknowledge that yeah. they... So we should continue it again? Yeah, you continue it to September. It was a year, so continue the Loomis yeah. case until next month? Right. Yeah. Okay. For the fourth month in a row. And, and now the other item. Uh, what? Yeah, I know. If nothing changes, then it will be quick, right? Yeah, well... So, this particular issue is... This particular issue is the uh, Arsenal Yard signage request. Hi, I'm Laura Portney with PCA. I've been here a number of times with um, Wilson Properties and the Wilder Company. So we're here tonight to talk about a proposed amendment to the signage master plan, which we had gotten approved a while back. I don't remember the exact date. Um, so I'm going to quickly talk through uh, some things that have been approved just to kind of um, get you acclimated and then Tom Wilder will talk you through what our proposed amendment is. We also have Andrew Coppolati with Wilson Properties here as well. So so before you go on, have they seen uh, Mr. McGoon's yeah, they, they response? Have. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the overall site master plan which shows all of the signage that has been approved um, as part of our master plan. We wanted to highlight what we're talking about today is a proposed amendment to change some banners that are located on the B2 garage from a civic use to a combined civic use with some additional tenant branding. One of the reasons for that is based on the, the signage that we have approved for the site, the monument signs and the pylon signs. We took an approach to minimize the tenant presence uh, along Arsenal Street and um, highlight kind of the, the project brand and have this unified look with the site signage. And so um, we're looking to potentially add a little bit more of a tenant identity as well to um, highlight some of the tenants that are within the property. So the, the signs we're gonna be talking about, like I mentioned, are along Arsenal Street. So we have our main pylon sign, a tenant monument sign um, at the right in, right out, and another tenant monument sign at the Home Depot to help orient traffic um, at the main decision points. So the first um, monument pylon sign is our, at our main entry. Um, this is at the corner of Arsenal and what we're calling Bond Street, so it's at that light. And this is strictly uh, project identity. There is no tenant identification on it. It's a 25-foot sign um, that, that strictly says Arsenal Yards and has that kind of industrial look to it. Uh, as you move down the street, at the right in, right out, we have a monument sign, which has um, some tenant identity, so we have six locations for tenant branding. And then when you move further down to the Home Depot entry, we have another pylon sign that has um, six additional locations for signage. So at the moment, this is the extent of tenant branding um, from a, a site signage standpoint, and then obviously you'll have the building mounted signs that are part of the tenant branding. Um, but from a, a monumental standpoint across the site, this is the extent of tenant signage that is allowed. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, can I ask you a quick question? Sure. 
this is the Home Depot entry is at the far end of the Home Depot or? So yeah, so and actually there is a, a sign that currently exists in this location. It's the blue Arsenal Mall, I think, or Arsenal Project sign. It's, so it's, it's at the, the light. Yeah. At the Home Depot. Yeah. So it's Miller's Ale House. Oh. Miller House. So it is all the way down there. It's yeah. all the way down oh, there. Okay. That's the main entrance to this site as well. Correct. Right. Okay. Correct. So Thank it's you. um yeah, an effort to help direct traffic a little bit. Yeah. Um and obviously provide tenant identity. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tom. Sorry to fly through, but I know time is of the essence. So <laughs> yeah, this is the uh, thank you, uh, Tom Wilder with the Wilder Companies. Um, my, my job is to attract the tenants and then once they're here, make sure they thrive and survive. Um, I think everybody knows today, uh, you probably go home and you'll find your, you got another Amazon package on your doorstep. We're fighting that every single day. Uh, so the bricks and mortar space is, is very challenging. Uh, so we have to really go to great lengths to attract the retailers and to make sure the retailers thrive in our bricks and mortar. And I think the response to Arsenal Yards has been terrific. Uh, we've been patient, uh, curating the space, selecting the right retailers, the right blend of national, regional, locals, restaurants, fitness uses, entertainment uses, and I think we've had great success. Um, but we still face headwinds and we still need to make sure that our retailers uh, thrive in this atmosphere because we have so much competition uh, with e-commerce and other, other media. So thinking about this, and I know when we redid, we did this uh, concept you know, a couple of years ago, we said, look, we really want to be understated because we're building a neighborhood. So we didn't want this to feel like another shopping center because we had a failed mall there. Uh, so I think we've been pretty subtle and pretty modest in our uh, packaging of the signage. You can see there's no, there's no big pylon sign. You know, at the main entrance is just as Arsenal Yards. The monument sign that's at the, at the right in and right out that leads to the river green is, I think, you know, five and a half feet by 14 feet. It's very modest. So can you just stop there saying, so with the, the, with the, in the plan that you had, yes. which ones you're talking about? She was talking about yeah. those two. The ones in the box. Let me go one more. Yeah, but I mean, on the plan, so, which. So, so you had it on the other one, you had them highlighted. So it was clear here's, on it. Here's uh, the main entrance, right? Yeah. Yeah. That just has, I don't know why that's blue. There we go. Uh, so blue. this is just Arsenal Yards Yeah. at this main entrance. And it, uh, so no tenants on there. And right now, there's a very, there's a large pylon sign that it has multiple. Uh, you go down to the right in, right out, that leads down to it, it's River Green, this yeah, is what yeah. we call uh, Eldridge. Uh, it's just a small monument sign that yeah, has okay. six of our anchor tenants on it. Okay. And that's the one that's like five and a half by 14. And then you get down to the Home Depot end, and again, that was that small vertical which does have six panels on it. So it's not a lot of signage, you know, so that's the project sign, monument sign, and kind of our small pylon sign. So there's not a lot of signage here. Um, and the one thing is we started to think about this, and honestly, this came about um, working with our friends at Marshalls. Marshalls has been a great long-term tenant here in Watertown. Um, we've kind of um, put them through their paces here with the construction that we've uh, conducted around them. And I gotta say, they've been incredibly patient. But um, they know, and they knew very early on, that they were giving up their typical branding package where they would have a you know, typical large sign, you could see it from the street and a big sea of asphalt in front of them. Um, and they typically have a major pylon sign. Uh, we said, look, you're not gonna get that here because this is not your typical shopping sign. Um, and they realized that. But I think as we've gone through this, and we've kind of, uh, kind of, they've experienced now the construction, they've experienced the large, the, the, you know, the mass of our new garage, they said, why can't we get signage on the garage? I mean, and they pointed out, look, we have, there's no indication as you come uh, west on Arsenal Street from um, Watertown Square that uh, there's retail there. You see the garage, you see the hotel. But even when you get to the main entrance, all you see, so there's, there's no signage here, and this is just that right in, right out that leads to the park. 
and this is the proposed area, but you, there's no signage at this end. And even when you get to the main entrance, you're just gonna see the Arsenal Yards project sign. Um, so uh, Marshall's uh, and very thoughtfully requested that why don't you guys go back and see what you can do there. And we started to look at it. We said, you know what? We actually think it's a, it's a great opportunity. Um, but we knew we needed to come become, become before this board. Uh, so we wanted to think about, all right, well, how would we go about this? Because it was initially permitted for uh, civic signage. Uh, and we thought, well, you know, it, it is a great opportunity to actually have, an, to do some combined co-brand uh, between both the, kind of combine the civic uses with uh, the commerce. Uh, of you know the tenants that are, are represented here at Arsenal, um, so that was the plan that we came up with. Uh, you know, I think the scale we tried to fit with uh, the garage and the size of the spandrels. We actually think the garage has come out to be a beautiful garage. We spent a lot of time, you know, selecting those spandrels, um, and we like the color and the dimension of it. And uh, but we do do think that this side could use some some color and activation, and. We don't, we don't see any reason why we, we shouldn't be considering um, activation, kind of dual activation between the civic use and uh, commercial use. So this is, this is the plan that we've come up with. Um, we think this is kind of at, you know, at the sight line, at both kind of pedestrian vehicular level, you see the opportunity for the four civic uses, and then higher up, that's really where you know, our typical anchor tenants are used to having their, their visibility and their identity. So, that's, uh, that's the proposal. Um, I think in terms of square footages, we're talking about uh, approximately 65 square feet of tenant branded area, and about 28 square feet of the civic area. These would be uh, banners, these are uh, fabric banners. Um, so they are changeable over periods of time. Um, they're not inexpensive and they're, they're fairly large, but uh, you do have that flexibility. Um, and you know, just just you know, the, I mean, the design of this is obviously it's it's a concept, and I, certainly there's flexibility in terms of um, what uh, the community would want to do with uh, the civic banners. Uh, we've said we think four uh, tenants, and there'd be major tenants on the property that we want to be have represented here. And I would point out that I believe that square footage of the sign would go into the, the square footage per tenant. So we're not, we wouldn't be exceeding the uh, the cap of the tenant that's already in the guidelines. So. I think that's it. Did I miss anything? Um, so uh, appreciate the consideration. Any open to any uh, questions or comments? I have a question. What do you remember? What the if you're suggesting these will be for anchor comment uh, tenants? What's the max anchor tenant signage? Okay, because I remember the standard is 100, but I couldn't remember what the anchor tenant was. So we must have a staff report here. Yeah, well, it's, so, so this is a minor amendment, and so it's under other business. So we provided a memo to you um, suggesting that from a staff perspective, we do not recommend um, this amendment or whatever you want to call it um, moving forward. Um, I, I hear, you know, I, we, we've heard the, it's, it's very compelling and I know that it's been very difficult with the uh, brick and mortar struggle, but I, uh, we went through the master plan process to substantially allow more signage throughout the site that is flexible and is allowed on the buildings in many different locations. And then there was a, um, a, a branding for the site it's, itself and then there was also a, an intent for this civic type of branding in the site, in particular along this corridor, which is a, a, a back end of the site, not a, it, it's, it, it has no retail presence, it's an access point to the park. So, so based on the, the idea of what the master plan was and how they designed the master plan with this end of the garage being really just a garage, um, the idea was that this was the way to soften the garage and make it um, a, a, a public amenity and a, a pleasing perspective, um, not a, a way to advertise more substantially the large tenants on the site. And so, so looking at the master plan and then looking at the sign master plan where they suggest that this could be treated as off-site signage 
and amend that section, which was really intended for just the Home Depot, which is off-site officially. Um, staff felt that this was a, a substantial enough change that it's, it's not a minor amendment, and even if it was a standard amendment, we, we had significant concerns with changing this corridor from that Arsenal Park and Harvard Vanguard corridor to more of the advertisement corridor for the for the entire yard, Arsenal Yard site. So it, it's a page long. I'm sure you had an opportunity to read it. I don't want to go into all the details. Yeah, but, right. so, and, but generally, it, it is up to the planning board. Um, this is our only sign master plan in town. So this released and allowed substantially more signage than we would allow anywhere else in town, just as a reminder and it had to be associated with this master plan so it was something that we inserted into the process when we in, in, uh, incorporated the RMUD into the zoning ordinance and so this was our first signed master plan so you know if, if you'd like to revisit or go through a different process then that, that's um, certainly an opportunity to do that as well but our, our recommendation a recommendation as I said would be to not approve this request so let me just Thank ask you. this a drawing we're saying is the west elevation of the parking garage. That's correct. I mean, that's the only area we're talking about? Correct. This observation. Uh, it seems odd to me to drive down heading east. Actually, you mentioned west, but you're, you're heading east on Arsenal Street. And you see these signs, you would think you'd pull in here, but actually you're not supposed to. You want to go on, so. It, it, is, a, it is an access point into the garage, to be fair. It's, it's, well, yeah. it's a primary access to the Harvard Vanguard site and to the Arsenal Park, but it's also, there is a entrance to into the garage. the garage on that end, yeah. and yeah. people have always used it and will continue to use it. So, do we have questions, comments? Yeah, I think I, just reading the, the memo from staff, and I have to agree, I think this was designated to be a civic, the corridor into the park. And, you know, there's no secret I live next door, um, and I'm not saying I don't want to look at these signs. But I'm thinking that even just in looking at your mock-up here, your eye goes straight to the tenant signs. It does not go to the civic signs um, because they're bigger. They're much bigger. They're two stories, whereas the civic sign is one story. Um, I think... Tom, to your point about the sign, the smaller sign at the right end, is there maybe is there opportunity to do what you're trying to accomplish here at that right in, right out instead, where it's more of the commercial type corridor? Well, again, this is supposed to be the the entry to the park, um, so I, I don't, I can't see myself supporting this. Others? Yeah, I I appreciate the planning department's critique of this. Um, it's it's striking me looking at this. I agree. When my, I looked at the signs, I read Marshall tenant tenant tenant, and I didn't. The colors are so well coordinated with the bottom part that I just thought it was all one sign. So I didn't see Arsenal, <coughs> Discover Watertown. I didn't read that. Um, what I'm wishing is that we could do both of them and do them better. Um, maybe the the commercial signs are effective, probably are. Um, I'm surprised we don't have more of them visible along Arsenal Street. But what I'd like to see is something more of, something that says there's a park down here. And this, this, this particular route is kind of where the public and private effort joins. This is where the commercial and the civic are coming together. And I think we could do better. Um, you know, I just don't want to say, no, don't do it. I'd like to see something that says there's a park down here, and this is an entrance into another part of Watertown. Um, you know, I, I'm not necessarily denying that there can be any commercial indication there, but I'd like to see something better for Watertown. I mean, 
mean, I'm, I'm almost thinking if you just took off the, the civic part of those banners, because I, I don't think anybody's going to read them, and they're not, they don't say, come on into a park. Um, but I'm thinking if at that level there was something that did pull you into the park, that'd be, that'd be very effective. Um, you know, something green, maybe, <laughs> some planting, some um, pergola structure, something, something that really led into the park, I think would be a really nice um, scene between the civic and commercial that happens on that, on that location. Um, so I, I'd be in favor of try again. <laughs> um, but that's my opinion. This may also be one of those things that when things are in operation, you're going to say, damn, we, need a, we really need a sign there. And, you know, we really need to do something else. It's, it's really tough to make this judgment mm -hmm. now, with it, I find. But, but, of course, you're trying to do it now. So. Well, but, and I, I think the important point, I think Tom made it, and I'll, I'll make it again. It's, and this is specifically was brought to our attention by marshals in particular, and because it is a sort of a reaction to the current environment. Right, and so it's hard to it's hard to look out three and five and seven years and understand how the uh, the entire development will sort of get knitted together, right? From a from a signage and from a, a, a retail sort of tenant mix, and so I, I think that you know maybe there's an opportunity to to think about this in a in a three or five year sort of time horizon in this in this case as maybe it's in support of Marshalls and some of the other retailers until the retail environment gets a little bit more um, settled. And then we could revisit this, this opportunity in this location. Yeah. That's something else. And you know, we, we, we brought this forth not because this is exactly what we want, to maybe Janet's earlier point, but because we think there's, there is a need for something on this west side that's maybe a little different than what we got permitted a year and a half ago now as, as the world has changed. And so if we could figure out a way to work some flexibility into this location, and maybe it's a three-year time horizon and we come back or a, you know something along those lines, I think that that would also be. Are you, are you proposing uh, three years of temporary signage on that this facade? I, it's very unclear what you're saying. Well, I, I'm I, trying I to interpret it for the board. I, I'm saying and I'm sort of responding to both, uh, both, both points is the point that Jeff was trying to make is it, it yes, I guess we're looking to amend the, the master plan's special permit for this very specific case, but if there was a way to sort of modify that amendment or consider again as we're as we're growing the retail environment and where I'm sure we'll be back two or three more times to talk about signage because we will discover things that we thought were appropriate a year or two ago yeah. and so is there an opportunity to build in some flexibility in some of these very specific locations yeah. it's a little hard to say too much about this without Steve here since he wrote it apparently yeah, well, that feels it, a little strange. It's, a, it's a DCDP Memo. What? It's a DCDB memo, so don't worry. We we have we, we have your back if you have a question for us. But yeah, but anyway, but so, the author's not here to present it. So I, I kind of agree with with his point, though. Um, you know, just that the the second to last paragraph about the allowing substantial amount of commercial advertisement in an area designed to be a gateway into the Arsenal Park and. I mean, that, that's kind of what the one that resonated most with me and kind of picking up on what Janet said also. It just seems like maybe it's the way that it's portrayed here, like the, the, the lettering on the tenant signs are so clear and everything else is just very like, you know, the, the fonts that are used make it really hard to read. So, um, it, and I guess the other thing I want to say, I'm really torn about this because I don't think it's a big ask per se, but I think there's a perception that that, you know, Boylston and Wilder have been back here many times asking for a lot of stuff. And I think generally we have been granting those requests for the most part. And, and each subsequent one almost feels like, I'm not saying this is your intent, but the, the feeling in the town in some cases is like, well, why didn't they ask for this the first time? Like, why, why do we keep entertaining these kind of like, Oh, you know, we just kind of thought about this, or Marshalls has asked for this, so let's let's see what what we can do. You know, I'm just 
that's, I think, how it feels to a lot of constituents in the town, and, and that's why it, you know, like sure. you Sure, and I, and I think that in 99.9% .9 of all cases in regards to various projects around town that are 35, 50 units, 100, thousand square feet, I think that you can sort of envision uh, during the planning process and through a two or three year RMUD rezoning, you can sort of envision, I think, a lot in a lot greater detail some of those things. I don't think, and I, yeah, we do seem like we're, we're back here a lot, but I, I think that's a testament to the RMUD sort of zoning process and how we ended up creating sort of massing and then to come back in and we have, I think, been collectively thoughtful about how we sort of have now constructed and advanced the project. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's, again, to everybody's benefit that we have come back because I'd like to think that we've thought about changes in the market, whether it's second floor. I mean, five years ago, we thought second floor retail was a great <laughs> idea. I mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, things it came on all of us. We didn't come back to change that to uh, a, a use like like lab that is such an economic driver for the community, right? So if that's one of the things that that people are sort of perceiving as us coming back, I think that's that's coming back and and being thoughtful and and smart about what it is we're doing. And again, did we envision that that marshals would be as cut off? as they've been and that, that they would have suffered over these last, we, we knew there'd be a small drop off in uh, sales. It's been precipitous, right? Yeah. And so, you know, it, and again, it's a combination of the construction activity. It's a combination of the garage and sort of cutting off that, that visual connection. And it, it's, it's Amazon, it, it's, the, it's yeah. online shopping. I mean, it's, it's a whole host of things that have happened over the last five years. So. We're certainly, you know, we try to, we're trying to be respectful and we sit in meetings, we talk about things and I say, you know, we can't go back for everything. Uh, we can't go back because, you know, we it just, because we don't, I don't want to be here at, at 9.30 on a, on a Wednesday night and a nice summer night in August either. But no, I, 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 I appreciate the comment, but I, again, I'd like to think that it has been, um, it has been thoughtful. And I'm, I'm sympathetic to what you're saying also, like, you know, in, in, this, in this field and in this industry, I get that, you know, a, a master plan process that, that is so long, it's not like you're going to nail everything the first time and all that. I'm just trying to tell you that, and I think you know this, I mean, if, if it turns out that this was not approved, you know, we are still responsible to our constituents to sort of like say that we're drawing the line at something and not... Kind of, and I think, it, and again, if, if this, for example, if this doesn't get approved, right, you know, we'll we'll figure something else out, and yeah. it's it's we're we're all big boys, and it's and it's reality. I think the the opportunity here, and you know, and maybe we didn't do a good job with font, and you know, we've really we've got the Marshalls logo, right, yeah. and that's that's really why we're here. The other three tenants are sort of afterthoughts, and. And maybe making maybe it's it's two retail, two retail mixed with civic and two complete civic. I mean, there's there's other you know other ways to skin the cat. Yeah, I was actually going to suggest that. I mean, maybe it's not as 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 straightforward as this, but there's a way to integrate. I don't know some greenery. I I, I don't know <coughs> anything that might sort of say that it's not just like Marshall's Park. Yeah. There's even there's even the option of looking at wall mounted signage on the you know the lower bay that's actually facing the parking lot that you would actually see as you're driving instead of turn sideways. But then as you drive down, they would disappear because of the the vertical. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so, so that when you're driving down the corridor or walking up the corridor to the park, you actually wouldn't really be thinking about it. But as you're driving, I don't know. There's a lot of ways to consider yeah. uh, on this space. But the hard, the hard part for us is that. This is always, we, we asked them about this, they designed the master plan as this is the back side of the site. Um, it's, it's not part of the, it's not the retail environment, and it wasn't really designed for that. It was, and this was intended to be beautified with these banners, and that was it. And there wasn't gonna be retail clutter or signage along this corridor. And so that for, right. from our perspective, there's, they're requesting an additional 260 square feet of signage on a corridor where there was no 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 retail signage allowed. Yeah. 
and, like, and can we just leave just, one yeah. facade alone? Yeah. I think right. that that might be the sentiment you would hear is like, you know, just this one. Can we right. just? I, it's a parking garage. It's not like I mean, it's a nice parking garage, but it's still a parking garage, and I get it's kind of kind of a blank facade. But maybe there's a better way to do it. And, and again, you know, I remember you came back for the building A. You guys went back to the drawing board and came back, I think, with something that was a lot more successful, and we approved it, and that was great. But this might be one of those times. I, I, so let me just say one thing, just to address what, what Gideon was saying. And I, and I think this goes to what Andrew was saying, too. Is, you know, the things evolve in terms of our thought process in the, in the industry, but also in terms of now we actually have physical buildings to look at and understand what the real sight lines are and what the impact of that is. And to me, this strikes as an opportunity for a connection, and it's not the back of the center. Um, and to me, that's, that's my thought in terms of the co-branding was, we want to weave this stuff together. I mean, the park is really now connected to Arsenal Yards. And I think we've tried to reinforce that connection through the River Green and through other access points and through the bike path. I mean, this to me is another opportunity to make the connection, not the disconnection of having the back. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I, and I do think maybe you know the graphics weren't the best. I think we we try we lived with banners um, and that verticality, uh, you know. And I think you know our, our people just played with real, and it was really just the marshals and didn't spend a lot of time in terms of, you know, how do you really enhance the graphics uh, for the civic piece. I, I did like Janice's idea. Maybe this is the way you, you separate the two. And you, you, because that, to me, it serves a purpose for, for the retailers to have it at that verticality, that sight line, from that visibility. It doesn't really serve the best purpose for the park or the improvement of the park. So I think there could be something more horizontal that happens there. But the idea would be we feel pretty, very, very strongly, I personally feel very strongly that there's an opportunity to co brand it. And if we design it right, I think it could serve both purposes and enhance, enhance the entire site. Um, so do we I'd, need to I'd vote like, on this? I'd like to make a proposal that we... Um, think about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'd, you know, I'm the last one that wants to see marshals walk away. I, I, I did my <laughs> bit to make sure they stayed busy this summer. But um, I'd like to... I'd like this to be a win-win for both of us. I'd like you to be able to go back to Marshalls and say, we got this for you. I'd also like to condition it on a much more robust pre civic presence in that area, um, whether that means signage or more greenery or you know, a, a structure. I, I, we don't have to design that tonight. But I would like to condition allowing the signage on um, coming back with something more positive for the for the civic end of it I think you know Andrew made the point you know thinking about three to five years we don't know what the retail environment is going to be like and Tom you made this point too but one thing we do know is the park is going to be there in three to five years and it's going to be better than it is today so yeah. Yeah. why would we not want to we want to be drawing people to the park just as much as we want to be drawing them to Marshalls I think is my part my point so I mean, this almost seems like a situation where if it were daytime, we ought to go to the corner and look, you know, I mean, it's, we're that close to it now. But the way you're showing it here, this you're, you're almost too close in from my point of view. You're not seeing it from this. There you go. That helps a bit. But you'd like to see a little bit more of the street. So as you're driving by, it's, it's back there. I mean, it's, it's, it's back there. So is there park signage shown here? No. no. Uh, it doesn't show it, but there, there is a monument sign at the entrance. For I'm sorry? Yeah. It's E1, it's E1. so it's E1. But was it in that, was it in that perspective? It's not no. It's, it's, this, uh, it's this sign here, D1, down at the bottom. Yeah. Okay, I think we need to see you're, it all. You're suggesting that they come back with more information. Yeah, they need to see it all together. together. Think yeah. about it. What the built environment's going to look like along the corridor with the signage and is, is that and and then how how to integrate the Arsenal Park? No degree. Look at that. And civic aspect into that or something. You don't have to vote on anything because it's a other business, but you, you can. You could say no, and then you could vote, or you can say come back. 
Is this something permission. that can be continued, like a petition, well, or? So it's 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 just other business. No. Yeah. So so you're making okay. so it's you, you can say yeah we want to postpone this to the next meeting and they bring more information, or you can say you no we that? just don't like it, or you can say whatever you know. It's well, flexible. the other thing is I agree with Janet in a sense that I think we there's enough faith and confidence in this relationship that we could say like yes we're in principle in agreement with the signage, but we'd like to see different execution so that they actually seem like not that the retail is not overpowering the um, civic and so much more legible than it is. So you've given them enough direction? Do you have enough direction? Yeah. And I think Steve's memo, I think, gives you pre pretty good direction as well, that it's like the idea was this was the civic corridor. So that, that's got to be the primary thing and the retail has got to be the, the secondary. So can we leave it that we make up a little motion that says we're open to discussing this another time. Is that all right with you all? Yeah, I know you want to get it settled, but it'll be settled negatively if it's settled tonight, so. so it's probably inappropriate for me to make a motion. Yeah. No, 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 I, no. It won't be seconded. We, but we, 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 I think we've got some direct, I think this has been, this is sort of, this was sort of the point of this mm -hmm. coming in and, and making this presentation. Mm -hmm. So we'll come back next month. We understand. Uh, all of the different we'll viewpoints, and I think we can show you <coughs> the peers, accomplish both. It appears okay. there's only two cases next month. Right. Mm. Yeah. We're good. We'll spend right. a whole lot of time on this. It could always be first. Mm. Well, mm. Yeah. You guys are never first. <laughs> all right. Okay, we, well, I move we continue this discussion to next uh, month. Any seconds? I will second that. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Sure. All right. I think we're adjourned. Yeah, yeah done, right? We're done. Thank you. So, Ingrid, what happened to the minutes? So you were in Alaska? Is that what happened?